Okay. Just call this meeting to order and remind everybody please silence all electronic devices. If we could all stand for our national anthem, please. thank our McKay Choir for that. Uh, introduction of addendum or delegation items. Before I get to you, Madam Clerk, the delegation under 10A is actually a presentation. Um, the Canada Games is part of the Niagara region, which we are a partner with, so it's not a delegation. It goes under presentation, so we'll be moving that up to item 9. Madam Clerk, any other changes? Uh, no, there are no changes this evening. Thank you. Can I have a mover and a seconder con to confirm the agenda? Councillor Wells, Councillor Demeray. Any questions? All in favor? That's carried. Any disclosures of interest this evening? Thank you. We have one uh, adoption of minutes, the regular meeting of Committee of the Whole 17-19 held on June 10th, 2019. A mover and a seconder. Councillor Beauregard, Councillor Bodner, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Items determining separate Discussion. I'll start on my right this evening. Councillor Wells. Number two. Okay. Councillor Demery, anything? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, item 8, 10, 12, 13, 15, and 16. Eight, ten, twelve, thirteen, 12, 13, and 16, Councillor? 15. Oh, sorry, 15, 15, 16, okay. 16, okay. Councillor Baggio? Items one and three. Councillor Bruno? Thank you, Worship. One, eight, and 16. So those have already been pulled? Okay. Councillor, Councillor, covered, Councillor. Doesn't seem to be any left, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> well, there might be a couple in here. So, all right, you're all set. Okay. For all those items that are left, we need approval of those not requiring separate discussion. Councillor Demery, Councillor Bagu, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Item 9, presentations. We have Victoria Wixton, Senior Manager, Marketing and Community Development for the 2021 Canada Games Host Society, and Doug Hamilton, Chairman, presenting the Canada 2021 Games, Niagara Region, which is on page 9 of our, it'll be in your delegation section, but it should be in your presentation section. Press the red button. I have. Thank you. I think someone controls the PowerPoint though, correct? Oh. Thank you. Mayor, councillors, city staff, residents of the city of Port Coleman, thank you for sharing your time with me this evening. I bring official greetings from our chairman, Doug Hamilton, who unfortunately regrettably got pulled away from tonight's presentation. But you get me, so that's the, <laughs> the better of the two. 
I'm here to give you pretty much a very high level of the state of the games for 2021. It's very important for us to ensure that when you're out in your communities that if any residents stop you and ask you any questions regarding the 2021 Canada Games, you have a little information to give them. And of course, then you have somewhere to redirect them for more information. So my presentation tonight is very high level. By all means, at the end, if you have any questions, more than happy to address them. So where I thought I'd start is just give you a little bit about the Canada Games themselves. The Canada Games, they are truly a celebration of sport and culture. The two programs, sport and culture, will be hand in hand during our program, both complementing and as well competing against each other. First held in Canada's 1967 centennial, so we have a good almost 52 years soon with the Canada Games. They're held every two years like the Olympic Games. 2017 was the last summer games, and we just got back from Red Deer from the winter games. And needs to say, a minus 42 games in Red Deer was extremely cold. So I'm very excited to say we're planning the summer games. Mm -hmm. 2021 will be the third time the games will be held in Ontario. It's very important to know because I am going to come back to that little stat for you. One of the things with the Canada Games, many go on to participate in the Olympic teams for Canada. But many athletes, as much as they desire to move on, this is it. This is the platform that they'll plateau at. So it's very important for us that we give them a competitive platform where they can excel, be inspired, but as well understanding that this is it. We're going to make a great platform, and this may be the only time they, they get to celebrate their sport in front of an audience. However, those that do make the Olympic team, a really neat stat is 60% of the medalists do come from a Canada Games platform. So it is a very productive platform for these young athletes. A little bit about the Games coming to Niagara in 2021. Being held in August, prime summer season for us here in Niagara, it's when Niagara presents itself best. Our opening ceremonies will be held on August the 6th, and the closing ceremonies will be held on August 21st. A total of 18 sports with 5,000 athletes. I'm going to pause and stop here for a second. How these games work, it's a two-week platform. Week one, we'll, we'll be welcoming 2,500 athletes. They'll have an opening ceremonies, but they don't have a closing ceremonies. The second week that comes in, they don't have an opening, but they have a closing. So what we call that turnaround weekend will be something very spectacular that we're planning for them as well. 5,000 athletes in the Summer Games. There are more athletes participating in these games than there are athletes in a Winter Olympics. So the platform that we're building here in Niagara is quite large for them. The sport program for our games. 18 sports competing across all of Niagara. These are competing sports. Their training facilities will be held all across Niagara as well. We also have three sports in the parallel th athletics, and we have two Special Olympic sports too. April 11th, with Sport Canada, the federal government in the province, introduced box lacrosse into our 2021 Canada Sport Program as a pilot project. We're very excited about this, and you can appreciate the excitement from our Indigenous community in regards to, and yes, <laughs> I agree with you. Now here's something really cool. 4,000 minimum volunteers. This is not an exaggerated number whatsoever. Our Canada Games host society, the group is very small. When it comes to the games, we'll have maybe 60 staff, but we will need volunteers to help execute this program. Unlike the Olympics where it's really heavy staff and still heavy volunteer, this is all volunteers. So we'll be coming back to your special interest groups, your community groups in this group as well, and looking for volunteers to assist us in all different avenues of executing the games. When we execute and make our website live in the month of July, we'll start to be recruiting right from the start in all different capacities. And if you speak French, those are highly desired positions that need to be filled, especially presenting sports from an announcement perspective. Okay. We're working with Niagara College at Brock University to make sure that we offer a level of experiential training for all of our students within those special curriculums. Our celebration events, our cultural program. Just going to back up a little bit. The sport of road cycling is happening here in the city of Polk Colburn. So that is going to be one of your major sports coming through the city. Just wanted to bring that to your attention. 
in regards to our cultural program. Again, like I said, very complimentary to our sport program. Our opening ceremonies will be happening August 6th at the Meridian Center in St. Catharines. It is a small venue, and it is the one that we've selected for our opening. Our closing, however, one of the things with our bid, normally the Canada Games goes into one municipality that has one mayor, one council, and so forth, and they do everything within one city. Our bid to receive the 2021 Games is a little different. We went regional, we are a regional bid. We involved everybody from all corners of Niagara, from north, south, west, east. And we put together a very comprehensive bid, which won the Games. And one of those things was doing something a little different to also improve the brand of the Canada Games. What we've decided to do is forego any type of revenue, any type of ticket sales for our closing ceremonies, and do one hell of a Hollywood show down at Queen Victoria Park for our closing ceremonies. Our athletes will have never or will ever experience such a backdrop for their closing ceremony. We'll invite our athletes, anybody they brought along with them, the residents of Niagara, and of course any of those that are visiting Niagara at that point. We're hoping to see about 60,000 people at our closing, and it will be broadcasted, so you can appreciate how great this is going to be on TV. That is our closing ceremony. Our 13 for 13 program, this is a very innovative way to get our spectators, our athletes, and the residents participating all throughout Niagara. 13 municipalities, that's including 12 plus the region, 13. And there are 13 provinces and territories in Canada. So what we decided to do in our bid, identify this program, is an alignment, bringing together a province with a municipality, linking them up in shared attributes, and doing a cultural event within the municipality itself. Normally, there's one concert site within the games. At the end of the sport program at 8 o'clock, that festival site comes alive and there's a concert every night. We're going to do little things differently. Between opening and closing, each night we will be going out to a different municipality and doing a really neat cultural event. So for example, how does that affect the city of Port Colburn? On Tuesday, August 17th, we have paired New Brunswick with the city of Port Colburn. There's some shared attributes there. We will come up with an event. We'll augment, on, augment something perhaps that's already on your cultural program, and we will bring the games to the city of Port Colburn for that night. We'll have a celebration, and we'll make sure that we do it upright. So we're already working with your city staff. They're already part of our working group. They're great people to work with, and we'll continue to massage this as we iron out what your event will look like just a little bit more text about what that program is all. And this is one of the things that actually won the bid for us, something very unique like this, bringing all four corners of Niagara together. Our torch relay. Why I bring this up is because we have to take our torch from Ottawa and we have to bring it down to Niagara. And normally it just, you know, goes from one runner to another, and we're not going to do that with our games. We're going to be a little innovative as well. We're going to somehow have a little route across Lake Ontario, it could be on canoe, it could be on kayak, it could be on a ship, and it's going to make its way through the canal, and it's going to come all the way down, and it's going to make its way to Lake Erie, and then it'll find its way all through all 12 municipalities and finishing up at Canada Games Park up by Brock, by Borald. So you will be participating in that as well. It's pretty cool. I think so. Here's some pictures of the Red Deer one, just starting downtown St. Catharines. I don't want to take up too much time here and just jump right into our milestone event. This is something that's happening on Monday, August the 5th. This counts down our two-year countdown clock. Now I realize that you have your canal days and I'm struggling from watching your Elvis Festival guy in my event and I'm caught between the two because I really like Tim E. But if you have nothing to do after your event, which shuts down, I think, early evening, please, by all means, you'll be invited to join us at the Hanley Grandstand as we launch our two-year countdown. Okay, So look forward to that invitation coming soon. Now, I want to bring this to your attention. The program closes out at the end of this week. Currently, right now, all of your schools shut down this week. They all have a special assignment with their teachers. They are helping us name and designing our mascot. So they have until the end of the week to hit their submissions. What is our mascot? Our mascot is a turtle. 
but let me explain why, many reasons why. First of all, North America to our indigenous people is known as Turtle Island. The uh, Niagara Escarpment is known as the heartbeat of Turtle Island. And Niagara, in fact, is the beat of Turtle Island. So it was very important to think about that when we were looking at what our Guardian of the Games would be. The case for 13, if you look at the back of the turtle shell, there's 13 large plates. 13 province territories, 13 municipalities. Kind of got spooky at this point. And then we counted the smaller plates. There's 28 of them. We are the 28th games for the Canada Games. Yeah, sorry it got a little scary. And then we thought, hmm, turtles do best in summer. We are summer sports, okay? So we started to align for that. And then we thought natural habitat. In Ontario, there are eight different species of turtles. All, unfortunately, are endangered. So we thought it's a case for conversation about saving the turtle. So our sustainability program touches base on that habitat. And like the athlete, perseverance, determination, discipline wins the race. So like a turtle, people say it's slow, but actually in its element, that turtle is extremely fast. You should see it in water. So like the athlete, perseverance, discipline, and strength and patience gets you to that finish line. So we felt that was the perfect mascot for our 2021 Canada Games. And unlike other games, we'll have to make up fictitious stories for the mascot. Ours is all, all organically true. One of the things that we said for our Niagara Games is that we wanted to inspire, transform, and unify Niagara and all of its spectators. Inspire the athletes, inspire the family and friends, inspire the volunteers being, doing something bigger than all of us put together in this room. We want to transform Niagara, bringing north, south, west, east, all together, doing something that's bigger than all municipalities put together, especially with the two legacy builds that we're going to do with Canada Games Park and Henley Rowing Centre. Once those two facilities are built, Niagara will never, ever be the same. The amount of sport tourism that we will be investing in Niagara for that growth of that sector will be second to none as a result of those facilities. The last one, Unify. This one's extremely important to me. Bringing all municipalities together for a bigger cause. Bringing all sectors together for a, a bigger cause. So that's extremely important to us. As I mentioned in the first slide, 2021 will be the third time it's coming to Ontario. But our tagline, once and for all, I need to stop and pause and explain to you that when 2021 Canada Games arrive, they will not come back to Ontario for another 24 years. This is it. This is it for me and my lifetime. And when they do come back, and for my granddaughter's participation, they will never come back to Niagara. They don't revisit another, the same community they've been to before. So this is our once and only shot to unify, inspire, and transform our region. And the games are for all, not just athletes, not just spectators. They're for all that want to plan, participate. I also want to say that we're reaching out to all your special interest group to make sure that anybody that wants to be included is included. For example, I noticed across the room Councillor Bogner. Working with the South Coast Tourism Organization is very important for us to bring anyone within that organization along for the ride too. It's our job to communicate as best as we possibly can and we're always here to take more questions and answers and phone calls as we see them. And that's really all I have to share with you at this point. So if you have any questions, I'm more than willing, happy to answer them for you and bring you a line for this great ride that I'm on. Mayor? Great, Victoria, thank you very much. Thank any you. questions from council? Nothing at this time? <laughs> We're looking forward to the new I Brunswick I heard wow, night. can, I, we, can yeah. I hear that a little louder? Yeah, a little wow. wow, it was a wow. Yes wow. it was, Councillor Demery, give a big wow. Wow. Um, so, no, we appreciate this, and um, I know with uh, the presentation you gave up at uh, Regional Council that mm -hmm. Councillor Butters and I uh, sat in on, uh, this is going to be great. And again, with Port Colburn partnering with uh, New Brunswick on this, we look forward to this. And through you, the Mayor, uh, we'll continue to work with your city staff, and we'll just keep coming back as more updates are available. How's that sound? Perfect. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, have a good night. Bye now. Uh, Council, because Joanne has to um, depart early, I'm going to move to items 12 and 13 first. 
Uh, so we have uh, Councillor Demery. Can you move item 12, please? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Community and Economic Development Department Health Services Division Report Number 2019-95. Subject: Establishment of a Locum Physician Support Program. Thank you, Councillor. Can I have a seconder for that? Councillor Bodner. You want Joanne to go first, or do you have a specific? You want Joanne? Okay. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you, <clears throat> um, Mayor Steele. Council staff, um, having a, a locum uh, policy is something that uh, other municipalities are moving into. Uh, having um, the numbers of physicians that we're putting out right now, so uh, let me give you an example. Right now, there are 63 openings for physicians. We are short 63 physicians, and we are graduating 10 family medicine residents. So uh, we have, I do believe, more than 30 due to retire in Niagara. Um, so and that doesn't count anybody who should fall ill. So um, and the new, new graduates are, are tending towards a trend that they'd like to try things out. So they don't necessarily want to commit and sign on to something, but they'd like to come and, uh, and uh, spend uh, six months or a year. For instance, uh, right now with Bridges Community Health Center, we just signed a locum for two years. Um, and uh, she's going to come and, and spend a couple of years before she commits. Um, we, we have had physicians fall ill before, and uh, finding a locum without locum support is very difficult. A locum on average uh, costs $1,200 per day. Uh, that's the daily rate for a locum. So what other municipalities are doing is, ta is, uh, is partnering with the local physicians and helping, helping that out. Um, I do believe that there needs to be a ceiling on that and that there needs to be a process where the physician does a written submission to tell us what that's for. We are not paying for vacation. Um, we are not paying for um, a physician to go and take a course somewhere to take a sabbatical. This is, this is purely to uh, ensure that that ongoing primary care continues. So, uh, I'm happy to take any questions on that. Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Joanne. Joanne, um, I was really kind of taken aback by this. When I, when I read it, I thought, wow, very first thing I thought, I'm not paying for somebody's vacation. That's silly. But, uh, you know, looking, and then I looked it up, and I, I spoke with Councillor uh, Butters about it, and uh, we, we had quite a conversation about it. Uh, and I went online, and I looked up what other communities are doing, and then I found that there is a, uh, the region actually uh, manages a family medicine locum uh, program for Niagara. So if the region is doing that, my question would be, why would we be doing that? Uh, is it one and the same? I, I'd like maybe some more information on that. Uh, sure, through you, Mayor Steele, to Councillor Desmarais. Uh, the region helps to place the locum and does the uh, credentialing and medical affairs, but they don't provide funding. Um, so the funding is comes from the physician that is uh, uh, looking to find the locum. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, they don't okay. provide the funding. Thank you. So um, if... If we were looking at providing um, financial support in, in the case of the locum, would that, if that locum were to uh, choose to, to stay here, we would no longer, we would not provide any further support with physician recruitment? Is that, would that be the case? Correct. So um, uh, I think what we would do is put the amount that went towards that locum against what we would normally provide for an incentive. For instance, if we were providing $35,000 for incentive and they received $5,000, which is the maximum for locum payment, their incentive would be $30,000. Councillor? Okay, thank you. And um, I, I just, you know, obviously it's something I don't know a lot about, and clearly your committee probably did a lot of discussing about this, but we don't all hear that. Um, I just, I, I wonder about this, this financial uh, assistance that we would be given, or giving rather, that would be given to the actual physician or to the, the group the physician is working with. Um, how does that happen? And why would we even be needing to do that? Uh, do they not bill per service? Through you to the council's question. Um, so what happens is uh, the, the physician to whom the patient is rostered uh, must pay the locum physician. That's how the, the ministry does that. So what ha what the, the money would go directly to the physician who requires the locum. Um, the uh, physician that's doing, so the, um, 
They, there are some things they can bill for outside of the basket, but there's, there's not a lot that they can because the patient is still rostered. If they're in a, what's called a foe, the patient is still rostered to that foe and that physician, so the bonuses would go to the attending physician, not the locum physician. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I really don't think that I really fully understand this because uh, it, it just does not make sense to me that uh, we have a model whereby people, you know, our taxes pay for our health care and uh, doctors bill for the services they're providing. And that's, to me, that makes sense. If someone's providing a service, they bill for the service, that money comes back to them. But that's not what you're saying. So this would be, to me, it's another level of taxation, and that I'm finding having a hard time just uh, being able to swallow. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, Councillor Demarais, the last question was my first question when they brought this up uh, at our physician recruitment meeting because I assume that when physician A is having someone in for them, that there's one bill going through OHIP. And if you're not getting it because you're away, then your locum is getting it. But um, I won't belabor uh, that answer. The long and short of what I've gathered in a number of years in physician recruitment is really it's a competitive environment. And I think until somebody says that, you know, this isn't the way we're going to recruit, we're in a competitive environment and need to. And I, I, I think that um, the truth is in the, uh, is in the results. So I wanted to ask through you, Mayor, to uh, Joanne, um, this is really kind of hit and miss when someone takes a locum, whether they'll come to that community. Um, will we, or have we both, uh, tracked this? And will we measure it to see if there's a success rate out of doing these locums? Mm. Through the mayor to your question, Councillor Bruno, of course. Um, so the locum that we recently had for Dr. Wilkes um, is currently expecting, so she is not ready to commit and make a decision. But we did have a locum some time ago um, in our community, and uh, she locumed and, uh, uh, for Dr. Wilkes before, and uh, she is planning on considering Port Colborne when she returns from her maternity leave in April 2020. Um, so unfortunately, it's um, because it's a competitive market, they do shop around and they do locum. Um, and uh, again, uh, it is a recruitment tool. It's a recruitment tool that many of the municipalities in Niagara um, are using. Um, and we are uh, not, maybe not quite as competitive as uh, one of the other communities, but we are certainly, um, we should be able to, get some really good, strong locum candidates. Right. And secondly, if I could, and last, uh, uh, if we've done them in the past, would we have any idea what the running tally is of locums to date financially? And, uh, and similarly, have they resulted in a recruitment here? Um, I only know what I know from the recent past, which recent. is funding the locum is not something that has historically been a part of the recruitment package here. Right. Um, but that was when um, the graduates were, were, were a little quicker to sign up within a foe. So within what's called a family health organization, which is a reimbursement type of model of practice, it's not fee for service. So the, it's a, called a capitation model. So how you get paid is based on the size of your roster, so the number of patients you have. So you can't just bill OHIP for those services. So what's happening is because there's so many of these foes um, and we have so many physicians that are due to retire, um, we don't want those patients to become orphaned because someone has fallen ill or there's nobody to look after them. So, and then it, it, it's, it's, it's a double whammy because now you've got also 10 graduates, very few of whom are willing to commit. They wanna try it out. So it, it is a very tough competitive market at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to pick up on what uh, Councillor Bruno has talked about, we set on physician recruitment together. Um, 
one of the things is <clears throat> if you never get a locum, you'll never know whether you could get a doctor or not. So, And I think Angie hit on something too that it seems like you have to pay money to somebody that's already making some money and it doesn't sit well with most people that hear it for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth time. It just, you know, but it is the environment and it just grates on a lot of us, but if you're not in the game, you get zero results. And I think it was wise to set a cap on this so that, you know, it can't be $10,000 for a locum. Um, I know Joanne has done a lot of work on uh, some other community also on this. And uh, I think this puts us in the game. It exposes us, uh, exposes doctors to our community and to also the practice they might want to get into. How are they going to work with the other doctors in that practice or whatever? Because it isn't always just a silo. So sometimes you just got to swallow hard and say, uh, you know, are you in the game or not? So leave Thank it that you. way. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Clayle. Through you, Mr. Mayor. I actually sit on Joanne's committee and I've done a lot of long and hard thinking about this. But I have had an idea, and I don't know whether it's something that Joanne thinks is possible, but I've also looked at the fact that perhaps if we can't get physicians, because I know how difficult they are, we've talked about it and all the locums and the costs, I'm actually looking at the possibility of nurse practitioners. I'm wondering if there's a possibility in our community. Nurse practitioners have much expanded practice compared to what they used to have, as well as midwives. And I think that if we reached out to some of these people and even uh, helped some of them, there are nurses who do want to go to school and become practitioners. Maybe we would spend our money better in doing that rather than look, trying to attract doctors that we can't seem to attract. And I, I just think that there are physicians in town that would probably be happy to have a nurse practitioner that could relieve them of some of their practice and give us that added kind of service that we need. Because lots of, lots of issues that people go to the doctor for, you don't require a doctor. If you have a nurse practitioner working there with their expanded practice now, they can take care of majority of the problems and they have a doctor to follow up on. Joanne, can you add to that? Joanne? So through you. <coughs> Mayor Steele, to uh, the councillor's question. Um, yes, nurse practitioners are, um, are very valued uh, in all of our communities. Um, they, um, um, unfortunately, unless they're with the, like the VON program in Fort Erie where there is one where they can roster independently, um, they can't completely practice independently, but they no. certainly can. They certainly can uh, provide a, uh, an amazing service, and I would wholeheartedly support that. Um, it is very expensive to go back to school um, for the program, and it is very expensive for the physician to hire an, an NP. Um, you know, it's almost $100,000 um, to hire an NP, so they have to offset that by growing their practice. So the question comes in to play is, we don't, we would again have to word it very carefully, so we don't want to have an incentive program um, where we would provide some financial support for the physician to have more time off. Um, there would have to be something tied to that, though, where they could roster, mm -hmm. where they would be, be willing to grow the practice to see the unattached patients. Um, so um, I think moving forward, um, and I would be happy to, um, to be a, a part of this, um, um, is developing a proper uh, moving forward um, which you'll see if you do read um, what's coming forward in Fort Erie. We could mir mirror it, but it's a f uh, physician recruitment, uh, incentive, medical education, and retention policy. So it basically has an historical funding of everything that's been done in the past, and then it outlines very succinct succinctly and carefully what we would pay for and what the return would ex be expected what type of return would be expected. Otherwise, um, you do leave yourself at a little bit of a risk of anybody and everybody coming at you looking for municipal support. Um, so I would, um, at your direction, of course, and at the committee direction, um, think that that would be something that would be very important to have. Thank you, John. Any further questions, Councillor? May I suggest, Councillor, that you take that to the physician recruitment so that they can come back to us? Uh, 
for the template of what, what uh, you guys feel they should go move through, move forward with. Okay. Um, any further questions on item 12? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those opposed? That's carried. Item 13, uh, Councillor Demarest. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, again through you. Um, Community and Economic Development Department Health Services Division Report Number 2019 96, <coughs> subject to one time funding request for amalgamation support for Colburn Family Health Organization and Maple View Family Health Organization. Can I have a second to that, please? Councillor Bruno. Councillor Demery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to uh, Joanne. Again, I was a little taken aback by this. I, I fully understand the physician recruitment idea, and I know that we, we definitely need to be competitive there. Um, now that we are, have now decided as a council that we would go forward with the locum support, I am even more concerned with paying for uh, family health organizations to amalgamate. I, I really do feel that when people are in business, no matter what that business is, they need to take care of their own business. Uh, and I really, I just get to a place where how many dollars do we have? And, and I think this is one that I, I cannot support. That's all I have to say on it. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Councillor Bodner. Will we give Joanne a chance to comment on the uh, application that she's, I mean, I have a question after that, so. Okay. Okay. Um, do you want to go through this then, Joy? Sure. Thank you. Um, so, in 2021, uh, the province is going to do a complete primary care overhaul. And what they're going to say is there needs to be a minimum of, we believe, there will be a, have to be a minimum of six physicians within a group. Um, the other difficult thing is we are the only community in Niagara that has a group of less than five. So it's very difficult to recruit to a group of three or four physicians because the after hours commitment is huge. Um, caring for all of the patients within that group is huge. It's easier to recruit to a large group because the commitment to after hours care is less. There's generally more administrative support, more nursing support, more back office support. Um, so in order to be, again, competitive within the recruitment market, it's probably better that we uh, amalgamate the two groups. Plus with the retirement of Dr. Wilkes Whitehall, that means they're not automatically um, what's called a family health organization and we are at, we're at risk of losing a physician because of that. So the last thing we would want to do is lose a physician. So the best thing to do, and there was a small window of opportunity within the ministry to approve this. It's very difficult to obtain ministry approval. Um, so uh, we, we did all of the legal paperwork, all of the paperwork involved, and received provisional agreement uh, for that to happen. Um, so they would be known as the Lockview Medical Group. They've already chosen themselves a lead physician. Um, and uh, they would be one group, but in two locations. So one at the new build across the road and then one at Maple View. But in order for that to happen, they have to have a common EMR. They have to have common, because they're going to be looking after each other's patients. So it will increase access to physicians because now you have um, seven physicians, right? There's no, six physicians instead of four. So they're all, there will be an after hours clinic every night where patients can go. Um, but they have to have a common view. So there's computers that will be needed and they also need some high speed internet for that to happen. So they need a fiber line at Maple View um, for that. And we need some administrative support to ensure that we can uh, get this group all under one with the same views. Um, so they did come to me and this is what they would love to do. This is um, as much as it's a recruitment tool, it's a retention tool um, because we need to ensure that we don't lose a physician. Thank you, Joy. Councillor Bob. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this one's almost easier to support than the one we just passed, I think. And thank you, Joanne, for doing a lot of work behind the scenes in a, in a what is really a short period of time to get this even available. So I think it is about uh, providing more hour, after hours care by physicians for uh, the people of Port Coburn. Uh, so it, it just makes sense to help this group out. Again, it, it's money spent 
on a business that you think would be able to afford it. But if it doesn't work out, then we're going to lose big time, I think. So we really need to massage this along. And it is uh, not much different than uh, um, giving an incentive to a doctor. We're just securing what we have, really, and probably making it easier for a doctor to come and join that group uh, when they don't have to do so many nights after they've possibly worked during the day. So just my thoughts on that. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Councillor Bruno? Uh, not to recant a lot of what Councillor Bodner said, but I think we're fortunate, and I'm sure he would agree, that Joanne's been at this for so long and she's respected across the province. She is in the know, and to seize that moment, I think we wouldn't have had without someone with your background and knowledge in there. I'm glad that we seized it. I'm with Councillor Bodner on the issue of, to me, this is, this is an insurance policy going forward is the way I look at it. It opens that window. If we don't do this in those two entities that, as you've said, Councillor Bodner, quite rightfully, one would think could afford to do this, then maybe one folds or one isn't a foe anymore. And at that point, you can't get physician seven and eight because you don't have that foe. So on this one, uh, I'm more supportive than ever because I think even against the locum, even against other things we do, this is a door that's now wide open to physicians. They can come in sit down, have their place, they're in a foe, the infrastructure's in place. So on this one I can see uh, certainly supporting it. Uh, I think it's a um, physician recruitment uh, bar none, practically. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any more questions? <coughs> Anything to add, Joanne? Um, the, the only thing I would like to add uh, through you, uh, Mayor Steele, to uh, Councillor Bruno and Bonner. Um, I think too, as we look at the new build that is going across the road, um, uh, it's going to be beautiful. And I think that that combined with a, a new physician does want does not want to practice fee for service. So if we have that foe and we have the opportunity of two different locations, it really does put in us in a pretty good recruitment situation moving Great. forward. Okay, thank you. No more questions. All those in favor? That's carried. Before we go, Joanne, I know item 14 has been passed, but thank you. Uh, again, we've shown a good partnership here with the town of Fort Erie to attract a new doctor, Dr. Uh, Joe Fralick. So we look forward to his services within the city of Fort Coburn and the town of Fort Erie. So thank you on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I skipped on to Joanne first. That's fine. Well, I know she has to leave, so I wanted to make sure she got in here. So I'll go back to. Back to the agenda. So the mayor's report. Um, as everybody knows, this past weekend was the first weekend of the. 2019 summer season, which was fantastic in Port Colborne and throughout the region. On Friday night, we had our Nickel Beach family bonfires. Uh, it was our inaugural, and we had uh, between 100 to 200 people at that. We're very well attended. Councillor Wells was there. He left before I got there, but uh, uh, everybody said it was a great event, and people were thanking staff. And it was amazing to see families, but just couples coming down, listening to the music, and uh, it was a great event. So we'd like to thank. Brandon's No Frills for the marshmallows and the s'mores. Uh, Oscom Steel for the first uh, initial uh, fire pit. We had to borrow a couple of others because they're so busy, but uh, once those are fully complete, they'll be pretty awesome. Uh, Chris Madronich, who was our guitar player that evening, was phenomenal. He played right through, and, and at the end they had the old-time sing-around-the-fire songs, which were pretty cool. Um, some I remember, some I don't, but uh, it was good. So we'd like to thank everyone for attending and the contributions, our staff especially, 
uh, Ashley through your department did a phenomenal job and everybody was coming up to them thanking them on uh, they just thought wow why didn't we do this before and it was just a fantastic night our next one though is Friday July 26 so look forward to that and uh, there'll be more out on our social media uh, on Friday night I also attended the celebration of the 25th anniversary of North American traffic uh, we'd like to thank Peter Vivine and Jordan Sherlock, uh, and we look forward to visiting their plant this week. Uh, we've actually moved up our um, visitation to them this week. Um, that facility was looking elsewhere, um, but a number of years ago, they decided to come to Port Colborne in around 2006, I believe it was. Uh, they picked a spot on Petersburg Circle because of the cost of land and the ease of doing business within the city of Port Colborne. Um, so they've been great uh, company for us here in Port Coburn. They employ quite a few people. They've done a couple of expansions uh, and they're looking to expand again. So uh, we'll be just, just discussing that uh, this week, hopefully with them. And uh, it was actually Councillor Kate Lee mm -hmm. that uh, yep. brought them into Port Coburn with her connection with Peter. So we thank uh, her work back then. On Saturday, I attended the 60th anniversary of Murdoch's Tire and Automotive with Donnie and Kenny Murdoch. And our town crier, who unfortunately wasn't available, but um, had a declaration which I read, and it declared that the man in the tires is now a Port Colborne landmark. So again, we congratulate the Murdoch family for 60 years of uh, putting the rubber to the road. <laughs> great, great, it was a great day. They had some couple of antique cars and lots of people. So uh, yeah. true testament to that family. Saturday was our art crawl. I'd like to thank... Uh, the organizers, artists, musicians, as well as members of the public who flocked to West Street Saturday afternoon and evening to participate in the art crawl. Uh, it was an amazing showcase of local talent. They made some changes this year. They went down West Street, so it was a steady crowd coming in and out all day long. It, it, was, it was really well attended, and some great artists were down there, um, uh, local, 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 but is, uh, in Niagara also. So um, that was great. We were, had a great conversation with them. Uh, going up and down the street with my wife. On Saturday was the Budweiser Challenge Fishing Derby. The Budweiser Challenge Fishing Derby was held on Saturday as well as with 92 teams participating with five fishermen per boat. It was huge. Uh, the weather was perfect out on the lake uh, and the fish came in plentiful. One thing I'd like to read here is a note from um, from uh, uh, Leslie Malloy of uh, Erie Track Row Outfitters. Uh, she just said, hey Luke, Luke Rowe on our second floor. I think it was our best ever, or so I'm told. We have had great weather for a change and the tournament went off without a hitch. The stats, pictures, and live feed of the weigh-in are on our Facebook page. Bob Rustowich placed first and won $21,000 in cash and prizes. He is from New York, but a good friend of many on our side. He has been fishing tournaments for years and the win was well deserved. The weigh-in show was incredible, with the winning box of fish being the last one weighed in. Dave Moody and his team from Dunville came in second. We had entrants in the tournament from all over Niagara, Haldeman, Kitchener, Waterloo, London, North York, Windsor, Owen Sound, Trenton, North Bay, and Alberta and Iowa. It was awesome to have uh, Mayor Steele, myself, there, and he did a great job. The mystery weight award wasn't my weight. Uh, what they did is they asked me to present them in a sealed envelope. Um, was a mystery weight, and they gave me between six or, uh, 17 and 22 pounds. Um, so it really allowed those teams that kind of were finishing in the middle or even near the bottom to have an opportunity to prize. So what I did is I went out and looked at my great-grandfather's picture. He was mayor in 1927 and 1928, so I picked 19.28 pounds. And the guy that won was 19.18 pounds, was the winner of $500, uh, and that was team number 85, Keeping It Real, which was uh, captained by Barrett Johnson. Um, uh, there were some huge fish caught all in Canadian waters, some of them right near our break wall. The average weight of our top five teams was 9.14 pounds per fish. We had one fish weighing at 12.07 pounds and 11 fish that were over 11 pounds, which was, is normally unheard of. Uh, there was a walleye tournament run out of Dunkirk, New York on Saturday as well, and their average fish weight was in the 6 to 7 pound range. Port Colborne is definitely the walleye destination, plus we have the nicest marina and venue for hosting these events. Um, they just want to thank uh, all our staff, council, uh, for a great 2019 Budweiser Can-Am Walleye Challenge. 
Uh, again, it was a huge success, and that's from uh, Leslie Malloy from Erie Tracker Outfitters, which you guys, I think, received a copy of this this morning. So our staff did a phenomenal job. Our marina staff, everybody from City Hall and the marina on down. Uh, the end of the week, school will be out for the summer. So I'm asking residents to keep a close eye while driving on city roads, especially near playgrounds and parks where children are at play. Remember during hot days you can cool off at Nickel Beach, Centennial Beach, as well as the Discovery Spray Pad at HH Knoll Park. Our air conditioned library also has many programs taking place where you can just relax and read a book or a magazine. The Valley Health and Wellness Center is also available as a cooling place in extreme heat. Uh, as everyone knows, Rink 1 has the ice in it this year where the walking track is, so it'll be a little cooler in there. This coming weekend is going to be another great weekend for Port Colborne and Niagara. We have our Canada Day celebrations. It'll be the Port Colborne Optimist Club. They'll be presenting the Canada Day at HH Noel Lakeview Park. Festivities begin at 10 a.m. and continue in the park until 6 p.m. Fireworks will follow over the canal around 10 p.m. Lots of activities to keep your family busy. Details are listed on our website on our events page. Um, but the Port Colborne Optimist Club uh, has their flyers that are out. So on uh, Monday, July 1st, just a, a schedule of events. We have, they have the Mad Scientist on at 10 a.m. The Music Depot is playing at 11 a.m. Joey Crawford will be there at 12. Uh, Drumming Bongos in Field will be there at 12. Their opening ceremony for cutting the cake will be at 1 p.m., which I'll be attending. On 1.30, we have Tara's Highland Dance. At 2.30, they have a puppet show. 3.15, they have a magician. At 4.30, they have the band No Class. And at 6 p.m. will be their closing ceremonies. So please come on out. They have pony rides, birds of prey, bouncing castles, alpacas. They have a vendor's fair, photo booth, snow cones, and food vendors. So Monday, July 1st, don't miss all the events in the park. And we thank uh, Port Coburn Optimist Club for, again, uh, putting this together. And that is the end of my mayor's report. Any questions? Seeing none, Councillor Butters, Regional Councillor's Report. Thank you, Mayor Steele. Glad to be here. Glad to see everyone. So uh, last Thursday was the Regional Council meeting, and I guess the big, the big deal of the night, or one of the big deals of the night was, was it a pay raise or was it being made whole? So because of procedural uh, rules and decisions, the one-third um, tax piece on being made whole um, did not come up, was not allowed for discussion. Um, as it was actually included in a budget meeting a couple of months prior to and was actually passed by a majority there. So uh, there's no discussion on that part, but where there was discussion was and debate was on the 2.9% raise piece which actually everybody did, did agree that that was indeed a raise. So um, the 2.9 consisted of two indices that they added together for whatever reason to come up with that 2.9 and that part makes no sense to me. Um, Mayor Steele put forward a motion that um, sends all of that to a citizens committee and that really is I think the best way to deal with that. Uh, I think it's deferred till to come back November, November. I believe. Correct. Um, and that citizens committee will then decide what's fair, what's not fair and come back to the regional council with, um, with their recommendation and I certainly supported that and I would say Everybody I know but one supported that motion, so I would say it was hugely supported. Mm -hmm. um, my my aim or my idea now going forward is that you know as a as a regional council we need to close the rest of the loopholes, tighten up the expense policy, and um, and I think that going forward was is probably I know that's going to be the next step, um, and I think that's the right thing to do. The other um, piece. That we that was um, a big item on, I think on the council meeting was the strategic plan for 2019 to 2022 was um, was presented that we had a strat planning session a few weeks prior to that mm -hmm. it was a really good turnout we we did a lot of work in that day it was a Saturday um, I was happy to be part of that so there's like a new vision statement new mission statement new values. Um, and you can go online and check any of those out, but I would say the vision statement, um, I'll just read it to you. Uh, Niagara Region is a mosaic in diverse communities. We strive to achieve a prosperous, safe, and inclusive community 
that embraces our natural spaces and promotes holistic well-being and quality of life. And I think when you kind of start there, many good things will flow from it. It certainly includes, you know, pieces on economic development and, and businesses and, and um, health and well-being. So if you have an interest, go check out the website and um, you can get a lot more in-depth information on that. Um, it goes into a lot more detail. The other thing that I was happy to attend, and Mayor Steele was there, was the Air Race Classic at Niagara Central Dorothy Rungeling Airport, and I know Councillor Bruno was there um, on the Friday night. I got there later and then went back on the Saturday for the unveiling of the plaque, and it was a really beautiful ceremony, and so much credit has to go to the organizers of that and, and the Airport Commission um, for pulling off a really great event. So my uh, hats are off to all of you, and... Um, that's all I have for tonight, and happy to take questions. Thank you. And Councillor uh, Klaylef was there on Friday as well. Oh, we, thank, we, we thank Donna for that. Any questions to the Regional Council? Thanks, Barb. Welcome. Councillor's items. So this evening we have uh, Councillors uh, Bruno and, and Beauregard and myself will be giving an uh, overview of FCM and Great Lakes and St. Lawrence uh, City's initiatives. So we'll do that last, but is there any uh, councillor's items first? Councillor Demeray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, have a couple of items. Uh, one, just very quickly to remind everyone about the Let's Talk series uh, from the library. It's, uh, this week will be on human trafficking. It's going to be Wednesday night, June 26th from 6 to 9, and it's being held at the Guild Hall. Um, they had so many people had reached out and wanted to attend that they had to get a larger venue. So Beautiful. very, very important, uh, putting a lot of social issues out there to be discussed and uh, bring awareness to what we're facing in the city. So uh, just bring that forward. Uh, another item that I would like to bring forward is something that we've spoken about many times here, and that is the vandalism and the thefts that um, that we see more in the summer than ever, and it has begun again. It was a particularly busy weekend. Um, certainly just off of Market Square, we all received pictures of what was going on there. There are other problems in a few other places here on this side. Um, on the east side, um, actually a, a business on Welland Street was entered and uh, trashed that's never a good thing either so they're active they're out there um, we definitely definitely need to be looking at the way policing is done um, it, it's just it's not effective enough and, and i know they're out there trying but something has to change i'm not sure what that has to be but uh, something has to change so i'd like to put that back forward and possibly it's time for the cao to to bring forward uh, his working group again um, hopefully we can do something on that Sure. <clears throat> Through your worship, Councillor Demery, it is my intention to get that working group back together and have a meeting. Uh, so far, it's just been getting all the parties to the table at one convenient time and location. So I will take that back and perhaps my shared admin with the mayor, Nancy, can arrange the, the uh, invites. Excellent. Thank you. So the other thing that I, I wanted to bring forward was... Uh, attention to a letter that I'm sure all of us got. I know it was in my council mailbox uh, from a resident with regards to the crosswalk and what he sees as potential problems going on there. Um, there is, there definitely is a problem. I, I, um, I noticed with the trees now really filling, uh, filling up with the leaves, it, it is even more difficult sometimes to see that the lights are flashing in the daytime. Not at night, they're, they're really quite bright, so at night it really picks up, but in the daytime there is a problem. And the leaves are coming right in over in front of the sight line. That's a problem. We have to find some way of getting a light in the middle of the road. That, that will make the difference. So we'll maybe a, you know stringing something over on a wire. I'm not sure exactly what will happen, but we have to do something to change that because I think uh, many of the people who are raising the alarms are right. There, there's definitely a problem. Clearly, people are not using the, the crosswalk properly, and drivers are not are not paying enough attention and stopping. But to be fair, it is becoming more difficult to see that there is somebody at that intersect at that crosswalk. So that's just going to add to the problem. So maybe we can get on that. Thank that's you, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. You can make sure that uh, our staff are trimming trees in that area just to make sure that the branches and the leaves don't uh, become an issue. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Demaray's concerns, as well as everyone else on Council, we'll definitely have them do a tree trimming as required. Uh, there will also be a report coming forward <clears throat> sometime in one of the meetings in July 
staff is putting together the numbers and the dollars and cents to address the issue on the crosswalk that Councillor Kalalia had brought up previously about uh, potentially putting uh, delineation down the center line of the road. Uh, there's been some traffic study stuff being done as we speak. Uh, they've been out and working with some regional staff on that issue, so that report should bring forward a number of suggestions which Council can then look at and decide. Thank you. I know in those sets of lights, because I asked that question to the region when they were here with regards to why wasn't there anything up top? Because last year, or, or even a bit of a, even a little bit more than a year ago when the province came out with the changes to these, they want to make sure everything is exactly the same. They're trying to get, as opposed to having everything different, so that, oh, and, the, and the issue with Ontario is that we haven't had these before where majority of other provinces have. So it is a it is getting used to it um, on the driver's side and the, and the pedestrian side. So it is a bit of a pain, I know, but they are trying to make everything uniform so that when you're traveling from city to city, everything's the same. So I, I'd like to wait till um, Chris has his uh, report that comes forward to us so that we can move forward with, with some of the things that we may be able to do outside the light side of it because they may come back to us and say you can't do that because we've had this is the standard and that's all there's going to be. So I think if Chris can bring that back to us and we'll be a little bit uh, more knowledgeable on this. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I would agree that that's, that's obviously the right thing to do. But in the meantime, trimming the trees is going to be, uh, it's going to help. But also, uh, it may be something where, again, some policing might make some difference. A few tickets for jaywalking, a few tickets for not stopping, and suddenly the word is out there and people are paying more attention. That could have an effect as well. And I think we should be doing everything we can, not just some things that we can. So, you know, yeah. that might help. Um, and speaking to the acting uh, staff sergeant, Port Colburn, they have been there where they've actually stopped and talked to people. They didn't charge anybody. Well, well, that's probably the next step, but it's, it's telling people, come on, you've got to get used to this. It was more of an information session, so they were talking to drivers and pedestrians alike. So they have done that, but I can certainly go to uh, uh, Staff Sergeant LaPointe, who is coming back in, if he's not back already, uh, from being seconded to headquarters, that council wants charges being laid so that really people get the message on, on the safety of this. So, okay. All right. I've got Councillor Bodner next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Ashley. Um, just want to touch base on uh, Centennial Park. Um, I think we all know there's some construction going on beside the park there. And it's very tight on the person's property, so they've been accessing the park to get at uh, their home that they're building there. Um, and I don't know if you know the answer tonight, but you can get back to us. But it, it, do we know how long that's going to go on? You know, people are using the park now, and I imagine this weekend again it'll be full. Um, is there any idea at all on, on the construction part of that? Ashley? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner. Um, the councillor is correct, and staff have been in contact with the property owner at this time in order to um, monitor the use of access to the park, particularly with equipment and ensuring that um, safety is observed at all times. Um, I cannot tell you this evening exactly how long, but what I can do is um, get in contact with the property owner once more and uh, determine a length of, of time that I can report back to council um, for you in order to answer the question. Okay. Councilor? So will this be going on on the weekends too? Or which, I'm, I know when the kids are out of school, the weekends aren't so different uh, or such a big deal, but people still have to work and maybe they'll be bringing the kids to the beach on the weekends. So if you could check that part out too. And I believe that the fence has been taken down on that side. That's correct. Um, how is that going to work? Uh, who's going to put the fence up? The, the property owner is... Um Going to be replacing the fence um, and with regard to your previous question yes um, peak periods are to be avoided but we will go back and talk to the property owner particularly in light of the fact that school is going to be out shortly making sure that uh, we are observant of those peak periods and that equipment is not in the park at those periods of time sure okay and also mr mayor uh, on the park also um i know we have a plan for cleaning the beach and and uh, by all accounts everybody's doing a good job but the seaweed the seaweed is coming in it seems 
a lot quicker this year than any other time. Actually, today it smells like August down there because the seaweed is pretty ripe. And uh, and I just happened on my way here. I I went that way and stopped, and there was uh, parents bringing their little kids up from the beach and ask them how the seaweed is. It's pretty good, but there's about six, eight foot of seaweed there they got to walk through to, to get out into the water. Um, if you could just share with us, and it, and it doesn't have to be tonight, you could be by email or something, because people from all over the city use it. It's just not a word for issue. But if we knew kind of the plan for the beach, you know, when it's looked at, decisions made to clean and everything, I think we could tell people then what uh, what they could expect. Ashley? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner, I will certainly go back and provide Council with a, I can report back at the next Council meeting as well as follow up by email to let you know about the schedule for beach grooming um, at Centennial as well as Nickel Beach um, and the other places that uh, the public frequent during the summertime. Thanks, Councillor. So, Ashley, with regards to removing the, the seaweed, we do have to deal with the Ministry on getting permission for that, or can we go ahead and remove it? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that will be part of the outline that I would respond to council with. However, it's true that we need to work with the ministry, particularly that we, we get uh, approval from the ministry in order to do uh, grooming at Nickel Beach. And so that is something that we have to observe, but I can provide council with an overview of those details in the email that I provide to you subsequently. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bruno. Councillor Bell. Thank you, Worship. Um, first item I received, uh, actually three complaints from two locations right at the intersection of Main Street and Elm. Um, basically involves speeding through that intersection, jake brakes on pickup trucks, revving, um, lots of uh, activity there that's creating a lot of noise and havoc and more of a safety issue for people crossing the road there, notwithstanding there's lights and walk signals. So I don't know if you could put that on your list like you did with Barrack Road and see if the police could. One, um, one lady I talked to thought about maybe even in the evening when the Avondale's closed, they could just park there and observe um, that kind of thing. Um, so that's one. Um, wanted to uh, mention to uh, the Director of Operations uh, about some first class service from Richard Daniels. Uh, resident in Coronation Drive called about our property, weeds, it's a wet road allowance. Richard actually answered before any of the two counselors from the ward and he answered in the evening um, and the lady was just overjoyed that she um, got this response from operation. She's been sort of on us for five or six years about that particular road allowance. Um, it would go to the then Todco um, subdivision if that had been developed, but uh, it's low. And Richard didn't just respond to her. He has an action plan to relevel it so it's not wet. He uh, indicated today that before the end of the week, if we couldn't cut it, we would weed whack it. So if you could pass that along to Richard and your staff for excellent service. Um, two other items. One is uh, one that's uh, near and dear to my heart, is uh, the beautification of our community. And it involves uh, commercial signs that are tacked to telephone poles in Port Coburn. Um, the man in the tire uh, has got nothing on some of these totems of seven, eight, or nine. I'm sure we've all seen them. Uh, private businesses, I might add, all from out of town who somehow feel that they can come to Port Coburn and stack a group of signs uh, on, uh, on our uh, telephone poles and around the city. I spoke to CNP. Um, and they say you can get at it as long as uh, your road patrol guy doesn't go over 10 feet. If he's got a six foot step ladder, take him down, they're supportive. So I uh, threw you to Mr. Lee. I'm wondering if you can maybe have a chat with Fortis CNP and just make sure that we're on safe ground. But I believe that if we take those down that all of us, many of us don't see anymore, um, once they come down, and we're driving by there with the, with the road patrol and we stay on it, perhaps we could put an end to that one blight on the city. Mr. Lee? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bruno. Uh, we'll coordinate that with Canadian Niagara Power and see what their restrictions are and see how we can uh, work 
work through that together. Great, thank you. And lastly, my uh, favorite subject and everyone here on council and their platform, laterals and leaks. I'm mm -hmm. um, just wondering where, uh, Chris, where we've evolved to what level of inspections on the 5,000 odd services in Port Coburn to uh, bring water to businesses and homes. And if you could perhaps give us an update on where we're at with that great program. <clears throat> Chris? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, yourself and the rest of Council. Uh, just to give you a brief update, um, we have completed the citywide leak detection program that under, went underway for about uh, four weeks. Um, in that program, leak detections that were found, um, we had seven uh, service connections that uh, were on the private side that have been either repaired or notices have been given to the homeowners that they have a time frame in which to repair those leaks and we found 14 leaks within the actual network itself. Um, with the, com the combination of all those using our leak detection calculator that's been developed by the industry over a number of years, um, that amounts to uh, more than 30,000 cubic meters of water saved monthly, which is about six million gallons. Uh, that being said, um, we're initiating in the first two weeks of July the pilot program, node program for fire hydrants, which will give us 24 hour, seven day a week monitoring within certain zones. That's our next phase in the leak detection program. And that will run in a specific area for a month. Um, it'll give us live feed data. Um, and then it gives us the information we need to go and determine where these leaks, it actually will pinpoint those leaks, both on the <coughs> network side, as well as on the uh, homeowner slash uh, private property side. So we're looking forward to the results of that. Um, secondly, um, we had gotten the numbers for the first quarter of 2019, and it indicates that we have had a reduction in purchases from the Niagara region in excess of 25%. So we've reduced our purchases from the region for water by 25%. And um, there's also another factor in there that you have to account for, is that um, there's a weather factor that varies and everything else. Our sales are down about 9%, but there's the difference in what we've done with the leak detection and in fixing those repairs since we've been in the field working on those. Perfect. So that's just to give you a rough idea of how we're proceeding. Um, uh, I have a, a great deal of respect and uh, I can't uh, thank the guys enough for the work they're doing in the field. And uh, I have to give them a public uh, uh, clap hand out if you would uh, and I'll be doing something on the side with them but the guys have really been working hard uh, they've been doing a lot of uh, work in the field didn't matter what the weather was in the last quarter and uh, they're doing a fantastic job of finding some of these problems and taking care of the issues so uh, kudos to all of them uh, they make me proud I can't believe how well they've done thanks Chris I think uh, all of us sitting here are very appreciative of this um, anything else counselor good uh, Councilor Clayliff. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Lee. I actually was going to ask you about the crosswalk, but you've already answered that. My other question is just, I've had a few people talking to me about the streetlights, and I think I've talked to you a little bit about it. Um, I, I've been telling them to go online and to register it there through the, through the website, and some of them have done that, and they're saying they haven't heard anything, they're not repaired. How long does it take so that when they come back to me, I can tell them? Chris? To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Kalelia. Um, actually, what we've done is we found the glitch in the software, and we're working with IT so that that link gets through to the right people. What's happening is it's not flagging in the system, and when they go in, it doesn't show anything. Okay. So this is an internal okay. communications issue that we're addressing. So. Good. So I gave Janice my list, right? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Wells. I have three items here, Your Worship. Um, uh, the first one through you uh, to uh, Mr. Lee. It's in regards to the roadside mowing that's been ongoing. Um, I've had a chance to, to drive many of the back roads over the last, reason, uh, last uh, few weeks, and a lot of the roads have been cut. However, there is being some concern being raised in regards to the cuttings because they are piling up beside the roads, um, and they will eventually end up in a ditch and we'll have to clean them out and 
cause some issues. So I just wanted, there's, a, there's an example of one of the, the cuttings. I'm not sure whether it's, it's uh, because of this wet spring that we've had, but uh, uh, the, the cuttings are fairly heavy on all of the roads. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, we may have to look at when budget comes to see if we cut early, cut more, rake up, do what we do. Chris? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Wells. Uh, yes, that's actually what staff have been looking at. Uh, we're looking at some alternatives. Uh, we're trying to do, as the mayor often says, think outside of the box on how to handle this. And so uh, there's a number of issues uh, that we've seen on a number of streets, as you see in the photo. And that being said, we're looking at uh, potentially different types of mowers being used um, and also the, the pickup and cleanup. And also possibly figuring out a way and how we can cut more frequently so that we're not cutting three feet of grass on the side of the road and we're only cutting 10 or 12 inches. So that's something moving forward and that will definitely be coming up at the 2020 budget deliberations. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, the uh, next uh, issue was uh, was raised to me and it was also, I believe, raised to uh, Councilor Demaray. In regards to some site development that's happening on Barber Drive and um, the removal of um, some trees, some blockage, natural barricade, natural bur uh, buffers that was uh, allowing the residents on the other, on uh, Chippewa Road area and also on Second Concession Road some, some privacy and some uh, of noise reduction and light reduction on those that sites. Um, and then it was raised, it brought to my attention that that, um, that development that uh, is a site alteration is being done without permits, so there's nothing to be able to tell the residents what to expect in regards to buffers or uh, any mitigation devices in regards to the light or the noise that's ongoing there. So the question is, is to uh, through you, Mayor, to maybe Dan, is is there are any plans or available uh, that we can convey to the the local residents that are being impacted there? Through Mr. Mayor, do Councillor Wells, we've been made aware of the complaints, and I can let you know that the Ministry of the Environment is aware of it, and they're dealing with the property owner with noise complaints. There is no actual development, no site plan agreement proposal. My understanding is that the owner of the property has an agreement to allow the material to be stored on site, and that's what's, what's creating the noise, because they're piling up on top of one another, and the noise being made of them being moved across one another because they're steel and the screeching sounds, because it's pretty bad. But they're in they have an agreement with an outside firm to pick up the material and transport it away. So there's no building going on, it's just storing on the property. Um, but we can talk to the property owner, make them aware of the site alteration, if there's any need to actually have an application before us. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Dan. Uh, just to add to that, there has been a noticed, uh, uh, noticeable increase in traffic going to Meyer Salad of steel down uh, third concession. Um, going down third concession instead of down Highway 140 uh, and then turning onto Brookfield Road and heading down to Niagara Falls. So if that may come up, I've only heard one complaint on that, but that may come up and may cause some problems with the road because that road is just not designed for that type of yeah, um, yeah. trucking. Um, okay, just, just, a, a, just to let you know what some, some of the things that are happening out there. Well, just on your issue with that property, um, I did speak to both the railway and the proponent. Um, the proponent removed trees that were on their property in order to create a flat area for their storage of, of commodities. Mm -hmm. The other trees were actually removed by the railway mm -hmm. uh, in and around the same time. So the railway was coming along removing trees that were impeding the rail line. So I think the majority that the neighbors were talking about because I did have one gentleman come to see me about it. We're on the rail line, which is owned by us, but we don't maintain it. It's, it's done by uh, Trillium Railway, and they went in and removed uh, quite a few trees too, so. Yeah, I, I believe yeah. that is the correct. But yeah. What the residents were experiencing was a yes. natural buffer, yeah. which yeah. was removed. So they're just wondering if it's gonna be replaced. That's all yeah. on that one there. Um, the last, last thing is in regards to a letter which we've all received from the GNC 
Um, and I, I just wanted to raise a concern that there were a number of inaccuracies and misleading information in that letter from my understanding. So I just wanted to raise that so that everybody can. Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and second one. That's it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Wilson. Councilor Baggy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have one uh, question here regarding the uh, canal days. The uh, during budget time, we put aside forty to fifty thousand dollars for uh, if it was needed. I just uh, um, because there was an article in the paper on like, the last week, so it just got me to wondering: Is that forty to fifty thousand still set aside for canal days if needed? That's all. Correct, and the uh, paper was asked to retract that because it was misinformation. The actual, uh, it was 56000 which was a grant we received from the province of Ontario that was discussed at the Canal Days kickoff. So there was confusion with the, with the reporter there. So our staff had called the newspaper to make sure that they retract that. So it had, didn't have anything to do with yeah. the money. That, that 50000 yeah. is still there. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, Councillor. Anything else? So the three of us will go up to the podium. And we'll give our reports on our conference. So as the mayor mentioned, uh, the three of us uh, had the honor of representing the city and attending the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities in Quebec City uh, the last couple days of May and the first two days of June. Um, those conferences, particularly this one, I've personally found very enlightening through the years only because we're getting information that we don't often hear from other provinces. Um, we all get kind of a lot of information uh, through news blasts and uh, and blogs and other information we receive in our council packages. But notwithstanding, uh, AMO is a great conference and I think we should be there. Um, we decided to divide all of the workshops, seminars, and study tours amongst ourselves so that we wouldn't duplicate the seminars so that we'd spread ourselves evenly and try and bring back uh, as much information as we could. Um, so I will give you my presentation on the workshop shop seminars and tours that I took as well as the trade X. Um, first one, um, because we've talked about doing our outer harbor um, logistics, um, port authority agreements with others, I had the opportunity, they had a tour of the port of Quebec Authority and they had speakers there with a large announcement from CN and the Port of Quebec, how they've come together and are going to do a huge expansion whereby they'll be diverting traffic from New York Harbor uh, to Quebec. But um, after the presentation was over on board the, uh, the tour ship, I, I had the great opportunity to have an hour um, alone with Patrick Robitaille, who's the Vice President of Business Development for the Port of Quebec. Um, we spoke in depth about how if we were to start a port authority, if we're going to negotiate with a port authority, what should be in, not in, and the loopholes that we might want to make sure in order for us to get our fair share of port development. So uh, I passed that on to the mayor who will speak to the uh, Great Lakes Conference that he went to. But uh, in doing so, Patrick allowed us to have free dialogue with him all through the process of, uh, of any of our dealings with the Seaway or the Hamilton Port Authority and a few tips that I'll share with uh, Julian, our economic development officer. So I think that, that there could be um, something there that if we do go ahead with the port development that we can use that knowledge uh, and the contacts uh, to make sure along the way we've got someone we can check with and make sure that uh, uh, we're keeping all parties uh, honest and on the up and up. Um, the second um, uh, wasn't really a seminar, it was in the Tradex that I'm hoping we'll pay um, 
some dividends to Port Clover. And I was trying to look at these conferences as how can they at least at minimum pay for themselves and at best bring some prosperity to the city. So here's one that I think um, has some great potential for us. I've had a chance to talk to Brenda, and Corporate Services Director. Um, there is a federal government program that um, is a, a, at no cost to the city where you take your PILTS, which is payment in lieu of taxes. So all federal lands, which include the seaway, um, Port Colbert now receives $117,000 a year in payments in lieu of taxes. Uh, this organization uh, is paid by the federal government to ensure that your tax roll actually has accurate assessment numbers, that you're not underassessed, and you may find properties that were never listed in the first place in our inventory. So I've spoken to Brenda about that. She has spoken with MPAC. They're gonna come back to us in two or three weeks. I'd like to do a layover or a heat map against what we know is federal lands and see if we've missed any. This organization will then take that back or any underassessed federal lands and do their due diligence on it and try and see if we're, if we're being shortchanged. They present it to the federal government they do all the negotiation, and if you're awarded either increased assessment on federal lands or find new lands, you can actually go back three years and be awarded all of that revenue. So I'm hoping, you know, if there's, if at the end of the day, the worst case scenario is there's nothing there, we know we've got a true number, and it doesn't cost us a cent. So I think that could be a very good uh, program for Port Coburn. Uh, thirdly, um, there was a smart cities uh, initiative. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to Brenda about and brought it to her attention is there are certain areas of a municipality that may need more than one year funding guarantee. So for example, if it was IT and you wanted to build a platform and you needed to go forward on a yearly basis, perhaps just letting them know that they have one year of funds and maybe it won't continue. You really can't in a lot of departments, if you're gonna do more than a one year program, have to wait around to decide if you can do the next phase, particularly if it's foundational. So I'm hoping there'll be something there. Um, fourthly, there's a company called uh, Tandemport and it does exactly the same thing as our Loop Row does, and we have a very good volunteer program, but sometimes staff leave and you're starting over again, or there's a lot of institutional knowledge in people's head. What this program does, and you pay for it at so many cents per citizen, it tracks all your volunteerism, it sends out automatic reminders, it does profiles on volunteers, it tells you how to get new volunteers, it send out reminders when your shifts are. It asks volunteers to tell you their interests, and then it subsets that and slices and dices all your data, and it's all saved in the cloud. So I thought I'd bring that back to Ashley, the group to talk about. And um, finally, um, I was talking to the folks at Municipal World, which we all get the magazine or online and convinced them that Port Coburn has a great story to tell about how the little city that can. And they've agreed to, uh, collectively, um, we could come up with an article, and based on what I told them about our community and, and how we've made some uh, rather unique things happen, uh, they would entertain, and basically she agreed that there could be an article in Municipal World about Port Coburn. So I'll pass that on to Michelle and uh, try and assist where I can in what I've told her and see if we can uh, get some free publicity for Port Coburn. That's it. So on Friday, May 31st, 2019, I went to the Modernizing Our Fiscal Toolbox in the uh, Election 2019 workshop. In this seminar or, or workshop, I, one thing I really got out of it was that there, the AMO site, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with, uh, has what is called a gas tax at work. Um, and what you can do is if you go on this, 
you can see a map of Ontario, and then you can see all the local projects uh, that municipalities have created or have done um, that use the gas tax money for this service. So if you go onto that, you can you can see it, and it's it's would be very good for our community in order to brainstorm or have any ideas of future um, uses of the gas tax fund. I also went to what are, what's called Connected Lab. These are presentations, short presentations from different vendors and uh, individuals. One of them was from the permeable interlocking concrete pavement individual. And what this is, and this would be useful for our engineering department in operations, is there's this pavement that it gets put down and what it does is because it's permeable, the water goes through the pavement and actually acts more as a filter and is really environmentally friendly and, uh, yeah, and is very beneficial for our environment. Uh, an example of a municipality that uses it is Kitchener. They've used it. And a, one way that we could source it would be the Green Municipal Fund. So that would be something of, of, uh, that we can look at in the future. Another connected lab was the 15 most productive apps that are, uh, that are out there. So this might be useful for uh, staff, really. One in particular app was called Asana. It's an or it organizes calendars. Eva by Voicea. This app gets invited into your online meeting, and the app takes notes for you. And then there's uh, Otter, which is similar in concept to Eva by Voicea, but notes can be edited while meeting is going on. And then there's also what is called the bamboo slate. So for those who like to take handwritten notes, if you write your notes on this, it automatically gets transferred into an electronic PDF document. Well, maybe not PDF, but electronic. And then I went to another workshop. It's called Managing Snow and Water Levels for Safer Communities. Now, I really, in recent time, there was an article that was just put out into the newspaper regarding our ditches becoming extremely salty. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this, but this is, and, and it, this relates heavily to that, so it was a great timing. Uh, so what, the city of Vaughan implemented this system, and it's called um, MDSS, Maintenance Decision Support System. It's a software framework. It brings together weather forecasts, 13 different weather forecasts, and weighs them based on their historical accuracy. Road weather information system, RWS, uh, pressure, humidity, weather condition of pavement, and um, yes. So this implementation, it has road configuration data, identifies segments, shapes files, number of lanes on each um, road, length of segments, and traffic volume. So the MDSS optimizes road operations. It saves money by using less salt and helps the environment by having less salt entering the storm systems. Uh, I also went to another workshop called Legalizing Cannabis, how, Muni how Municipalities Are Adapting. An individual named Neil Dubbert, he's a chief constable of Delta Police, I believe Delta is a municipality in BC. He spoke about how uh, there's a case study of, of a, of a I don't know, grow up, I guess you say, Pearson Nursery as a growing marijuana facility. And he talks about 26% of greenhouses are converted into cannabis grow. So since legalization of, of cannabis, a lot of people are switching from other crops and producing cannabis because it's, uh, I guess there's more money to be into it. So that has actually had other consequences, being that there's less food available. So uh, <laughs> then there's the municipalities and the affordable housing crisis. So. As counselors may know, I take this to heart. I come from a generation that is dealing with, uh, essentially the truth is it's hard for us to, in the millennials, to own a home. So the affordable housing crisis is dear to me. And there was one speaker who came and talked about, uh, about this. And he's from a think tank called UPGO. It's Urban Politics and Governance Lab. It's from McGill University. And his studies look focused on how Airbnb is affecting affordable housing in across Canada, across North America, across, I guess, the world, you can say. And uh, what is happening is a lot of condos and apartments are left empty or strictly for the use. And this affects mostly larger municipalities, but it is coming in, uh, is affecting rural communities more so. But they're 
these condos and apartments are strictly used for Airbnb, and they could be used for housing. And so that has had, and I guess Montreal is where that is impacted the most. Montreal is a huge, uh, has a huge problem with that. So one interesting, one interesting stat is that 130,000 Airbnb rentals are up for reservations every day in Canada. <laughs> and 2% uh, or more of the housing in large cities that could be a home for a family are taken up by short-term rentals. Montreal is the worst. So that's some of the information I got from there. And if there's any information you want to receive uh, from me, please, please feel free to ask. And this list is by no means exhaustive. I've also went to others. This is just what I found most interesting and useful. Thanks, Thanks sir. Good job, guys. Um, so as been noted, I attended the conference from May 30th to June the 2nd uh, with, with Gary and Eric, as well as uh, CAO Scott Louie. And the conference, theme was the conference theme was Building Better Lives. And as Gary had mentioned, we split attending the various sessions. And the ones that I looked after were procuring low carbon solutions. Uh, within our municipality, we all have a role in reducing our greenhouse gases. Municipalities are on the front lines of reducing emissions. The challenge is complex and puts pressure on municipal leaders to embrace low carbon solutions that stand up to scrutiny. Having a solid understanding of the issue is essential. Portland, Oregon uh, had a presentation on low carbon concrete. Uh, it's the same cost of, of today's concrete, um, but, it, but it's uh, a low carbon footprint when it's, when it's uh, processed. And the new construction has uh, the use of this new, or any new construction uh, can use this new concrete. It actually speeds up construction time because it takes less time to cure. And one question at the seminar was, you know, well, well, why isn't it always out there? Why isn't it out there more? Because everybody's got to change over the machinery. So as they're changing over machinery, because they can't stop making concrete, so it's kind of uh, hand in hand, but you're going to see more and more of this, that you'll only be able to buy this. So that was a comment. So I know, I'm, I'm sure Chris has heard of this, I hope, uh, that guys have been down here. So hopefully in Niagara that any of our concrete uh, manufacturers will, will obviously roll over to this. We had the Concrete Manufacturers Association in the conference uh, with us and in this seminar, and they are making sure that their whole um, membership is, is going to this. So it, it's going to be better for us in the future as far as how uh, projects go. Uh, it'll actually cut down the, uh, the time to actually build these things. So that was a, uh, uh, actually a very good uh, seminar that I attended. We had a rural town hall, uh, Driving Tomorrow's Growth. Uh, thriving and prosperous rural communities are key to driving Canada's economic future. We heard from speakers about federal initiatives designed to drive growth in rural areas. FCM is working to build better lives in rural communities from universal broadband to doubling of this year's gas tax uh, fund transfer, which we received earlier this year, of uh, a little over 700,000, Scott, I think it was, around 700, that's, or 575. 575 was our, our amount on that. So it was an additional 575,000 to the city of Park Orr. Across Canada, we're hoping to have 90% of homes connected with internet by 2021. 95% by 2026, and 100% by the year 2030 is the goal of FCM and the federal government. I attended the Building Vibrant Rural Economies. Uh, rural Canada is becoming a more desirable place for business investment, and with the right tools, we can attract that investment and build prosperous, livable communities. A uh, speaker talked about how uh, social infrastructure from healthcare to housing and how that builds better lives. So that was a good uh, a seminar that we attended. I've got a little bit more information on that uh, with some other things that tie into it. I did the festivals and other community events uh, called Risks and Rewards. I mean, it was, it was a good seminar for those that really haven't touched on this, but we have in a, in a lot of ways, most of council has, and uh, certainly our staff has. Uh, Frank Cowan was the was the risk manager side of it. We've gone through a lot of that over the years within the city of Port Coburn. And then they had a gentleman that spoke about the challenges and opportunities of raising money and offsetting costs through sponsorship revenue. So we talked about a lot of things that we're actually already doing here uh, through Ashley's department. Uh, but he did talk about that you really don't want to put a name on every building that you own. You want to keep things unique. So I thought that was kind of a, a good buy-in. I was hoping they would have had two or three um, festivals across Canada that, you know, had issues or, you know, went off without really a hitch and 
they could come and give us a little bit more ideas, but uh, they really talked about more of the money side and, and the risk management side, which I think we do a good job here. But um, um, when you go, when you attend these, you never know what you see when you when you leave. So, um, but it was it was interesting. Uh, while Gary did the uh, port uh, tour, um, which originally I was supposed to go on, but I switched up with Gary only because there was a, an issue here uh, uh, that I I wanted to go to not because, just because of Port Colburn, but because of my position on the Police Services Board. And it was called Responding to the Drug Crisis in Our Communities. Um, the Deputy Chief of Peterborough, who's, um, he, he's one of the mainstays across Canada in this program, and he deals with a lot of communities across Canada. So our speakers talked about the current public health crisis unfolding in our communities, and some community-based approaches to prevention and education, as well as harm reduction, treatment, and enforcement. And the big thing that we came out of this was, this should not be looked at as, or as a policing issue, but as a health issue. It's not a policing issue. And all the experts that were there from across Canada all um, made sure that that was front and center whenever they spoke uh, during that session. Uh, Winnipeg has a drug, drug task force uh, with health, health officials and police involved. And the other thing that came out of it, and I think uh, we can learn something from Winnipeg, so that's up and running now. So there will be more information coming out of that and we can actually go forward, which I'm going to be taking to the Police Services Board with regards to our uh, board and police chief and his staff to get more information coming out of Winnipeg and see how that can best work in Niagara uh, and work both with the Niagara region as well as our municipalities. Um, the big thing that came out of this, and again, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Farkhart um, said, we need to create a drug strategy and it must have investment in the youth. Uh, the City of Waterloo have a youth engagement program uh, which is working very well for them. Again, this is something I could take back to the Police Services Board. We can discuss it with A, the Niagara Region, and B, our local municipalities to come up with a, a good plan for Niagara and, and all our municipalities and how we can actually uh, do youth engagement uh, better than we do now. Um, so that, that I really wanted to attend, so I do thank Gary for doing the ports uh, issue on that. As well at FCM, uh, they also uh, talked about um, more funding, more opportunities. So they talked about the Green Municipal Fund. Uh, they bring local sustainability projects to life and help build better lives for Canadians. So the federal budget of 2019 significantly expands the existing work of FCM's Green Municipal Fund, creating new opportunities for you to make your residents' lives more secure and affordable. Uh, there's some things that, we're, uh, that are coming out in the next uh, few months. Make affordable and social housing units more energy efficient. Support home energy projects to make homes more affordable and energy efficient. And support activities that reduce GHG emissions from large community buildings. Since 2000, uh, the Green Municipal Fund has deployed $900 million in financing to over 1,250 sustainable initiatives while preserving every dollar for, of capital supplied by government with its proven infrastructure and expertise, FCM is ready to deliver on a larger scale. So we will be uh, delving into this with our staff uh, with regards to projects that we have going forward. Uh, the other funds that we do, uh, they fund brownfields, brownfield site redevelopment, community brownfield action plans, renewable energy production on a brownfield, site remediation or risk management, uh, energy, energy recovery or district energy, new construction of energy efficient municipal facilities, Retrofit of community projects and retrofit of municipal facilities. Transportation, reduce fossil fuel use in fleets. Transportation networks and commuting options. Waste, waste diversion and waste stream management. And water, wastewater systems, septic wastewater systems, stormwater quality, community and municipal projects, and water conservation community municipal projects. So these are a number of things that they fund. So again, uh, our staff can move forward with projects that we have and we can apply for funding uh, with regards to these and it will help defer it to always going on our tax base because that money is available. So that was uh, FCM. I also uh, attended, uh, I flew home on the 4th of June at uh, 7 p.m. and flew out at 6.30 on the 5th of June uh, to Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, I attended this conference, uh, as I said, from June 5th to 7th. Uh, with Mayor Senzik of St. Catharines, who sits on the board, and Mayor Redekop of Fort Erie. The conference theme was Living Blue, Transforming Waterfronts, Economically, Socially, and Sustainably. And the following is a recap of the plenaries I attended. 
uh, creating healthier communities through waterfront access. The panel highlighted new ways to bring people to the waterfront by providing trails, swimming piers, clean beaches, entertainment, and engaging space that help contribute to healthier lifestyles. Having waterfronts that are clean, green, and connected attract people and employers to our community. Untapped potential waterfront economic development. We understand the best potential for our waterfronts. The region uh, grew on the backbone of working waterfronts and industries that relied on an abundance of fresh water and access to shipping. The panel discussed how communities today can harness their waterfronts to continue economic growth, growth and development while balancing the need for sustainability and accessibility to our waterfronts. Uh, the Sheboygan River Cleanup Project. Um, on the one day we took a, about a three hour uh, bus tour of the length of either side of the Sheboygan River that they did a massive cleanup. Sheboygan was a, a marine town, huge marine town at one time with, with coal and coke piles, uh, a terminal for uh, heating oil for homes. They had tanneries, uh, chemical plants, and a myriad of industry that the buildings are still there, but they've been repurposed. So the water itself was very contaminated, but it really gelled from the bottom of the river. And it's not a very fast moving river, and with the advent of their marine industry collapsing and all that moving away, um, there was very little movement within the river so that it didn't move the um, sediment uh, very much, which turns out to be a good thing. So they spent millions upon millions of dollars uh, with federal and state uh, funding and they cleaned up their river. They brought back uh, wetlands, uh, actually made some of the areas into larger wetlands. Uh, they looked at how they can control Canada geese. The Americans do not like our Canada geese. Um, <laughs> They had a huge Kinsman Park there, and they, they're not getting the geese in the park anymore because the way they laid out their river uh, front with the plants that they put in. So what they did is they actually built nesting areas on the water that the geese like, but they can't get past that. So there's no fencing. It's all uh, green plant life. So it was actually quite interesting. Uh, they rebuilt their uh, mouth of the river, probably went back about, um, oh, I'd say a little over a quarter mile. Today that's a mixture of um, commerce. Uh, some small industry that are there that have taken over the, the previous polluters. They're all clean industry. Uh, restaurants, retail. Um, I met one uh, uh, charter company. Uh, they have a huge salmon uh, charter business uh, there. It's called Dumper Dance. They own six boats in, in Sheboygan. They actually own 22 boats across uh, Lake Michigan. And every day their boats are out. I met five women at their uh, great cleaning station, which Mark and I spoke about, I brought the pictures back from him, for him, and uh, they had a great day out. So they have actually a fish cleaning station right there uh, next to their public washrooms. Lots of green space along the riverfront. In fact, if you look at our boardwalk along our canal, it mirrors what they did. It's the same blue painted railing, the same railing, so it's, it's a, a common theme that you, you allow the, the public use. And then on the far side, there were some commercial fishermen, uh, no different than we have miners uh, here in Port Colborne and then uh, some small marina areas. But there was probably about 34 uh, charter boats that go out of there for salmon and lake trout. So it's actually a, a booming business. And the guy from Dumper Dan's, I met the owner, and he was phenomenal. He goes, anytime you need any information uh, from me on how this stuff works, uh, please uh, have anybody in your community contact me or, or the city direct, which I, I really appreciated. Um, lead pipes and infrastructure. Um, although it isn't, wasn't or hasn't been a huge issue here uh, because in most uh, homes everything is galvanized or seems to be galvanized. But we had Mayor Weaver of Flint, Michigan who actually, um, we flew in from Detroit and then she shared our van ride in from uh, Milwaukee. Um, she was very interesting. As everybody knows, Flint had a huge issue with contaminated water created by their own lack of moving their lead pipes into modern, healthy type of infrastructure. Um, she talked about the lead pipe issue, including bad water and infrastructure. All their infrastructure now is to modern standards, and they're now working with residents to replace lead pipes in homes and laterals in their homes. We also spoke, uh, or at the same time we had, uh, because it was a, a, a three-member uh, panel, Mayor uh, Barrett of Milwaukee uh, spoke uh, about their infrastructure and that anything, he was telling us, that anything built pre-1951 in, in the state of Wisconsin uh, had, uh, con in, contained lead pipes, all the houses. They just used strictly lead. Um, and they have a similar project going on that uh, Flint has. 
uh, moving forward, they uh, pretty much have all their in-ground infrastructure that the city owns uh, into modern uh, safe infrastructure. And they're working now with the lead laterals that go into homes. And they're working with homeowners and how to replace uh, the lead pipes actually within the homes. So that was actually really good from, from those two. And I'll tell you, the mayor of Milwaukee, uh, I was able to have dinner with him with uh, Mayor Redekop the one evening. Fantastic guy. He's just amazing at what he's done. He's been a congressman in Washington, and now he's been a three-term mayor in Milwaukee. And um, just speaking to him about his port uh, front, his railway, um, you know, the city itself uh, was, was pretty enlightening. So we, we had a good meal with him uh, at one of the uh, dinners. Uh, the other uh, seminar that I went to was assessing the impacts of climate change on the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Basin and how to move forward. We had a fellow by the name of Don Wubbles, who's a professor of atmospheric science at the University of Illinois. He talked about climate change and its effects on the Great Lakes. Just some uh, points uh, out of him, uh, or from his uh, talk to us. Uh, just some public and economic impacts of Great Lakes changes. A drop in lake levels reduces cargo capacity, but longer shipping season. Irrigation in the region likely to increase. Changing weather and climate conditions put stresses on physical infrastructure, roads, sewers. Climate change threatens indigenous people's livelihoods and economies, including agriculture, hunting, gathering, fishing, forestry, energy, recreation, and tourism enterprises. Some policy solutions to modernize energy uh, sources, accelerate development of renewable energy, accelerate implementation of energy efficiency, accelerate adoption of electric vehicles, develop a more decentralized electricity system based on more distribution uh, of renewable energy. How to protect waterways and wetlands, limit agricultural runoff of phosphorus pollution from manure and excess fertilizer to reduce harmful algae blooms that are exasperated by climate change and threaten, threaten uh, they do threaten safe drinking water, fisheries, outdoor recreation in Western Lake Erie, Green Bay, and other shallow bays. Design, develop, and install green infrastructure ranging from wetlands restoration to permeable pavement which we just heard about, to adapt to climate change and protect shorelines and wildlife, uh, and restore the proposed $475 million of annual federal funding. This is the U.S. side for the successful Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which is on the U.S. side again. Uh, some of his conclusions, allowing the vast, beautiful natural resources of the Great Lakes to be taken for granted and degraded through human activity, including the effects of climate change, uh, this is not an option. We all need the Great Lakes uh, to remain healthy, unpolluted, and productive. Climate change is already having an impact on the region, and there is evidence that such impacts may increase under expected future climate change. And responding to these stresses requires both avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable. So uh, that was from the doctor. And I have um, just some information from the mayor of Ajax who spoke um, with regards to planning for the future. Um, he gave actually a, 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 a great uh, discussion on what Ajax has been doing uh, with regards to their waterfront and how they've been redeveloping that. Um, their formula for success was vision and political will plus community pride plus maintenance and improvement strategies, plus strategic partnerships. The Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River Waterway has 110 plus port cities and towns, 230 million metric tons of cargo with a $100 billion value that go through the Great Lakes each year. Activity delivers significant economic benefits. Binational Great Lakes St. Lawrence shipping contributes Economic activity, Canadian, $59.2 billion. Personal income, Canadian, $23.2 billion. Taxes, Canadian, $11.7 billion. Jobs, 328500 uh, through the Marine uh, and, uh, Initiative. So moving forward, uh, the mayor said, maintaining our jewel, which is our Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway, or St. Lawrence uh, River, Respecting the legacy, innovating anti-litter and waste solutions, monitoring legislative and regulatory changes. He included cannabis and alcohol with that. 
continuing promotion and awareness uh, with regards to our Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River. Uh, two other things here, our press conference on Asian carp, um, which I've uh, touched on earlier, a press conference was held where the member mayors signed the mayor's declaration to stop Asian carp. Since the first Asian carp appeared, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative have taken the issue very seriously. These four fish species from Asia, called Asian carp, were introduced to clean up ponds in the southern U.S. Unfortunately, spills and flooding allowed them to enter the Mississippi and other rivers, where they have made their way to the edge of the Great Lakes, just outside of Joliet, um, and threatening the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River and our entire ecosystem. As I've stated, $7 billion hit to the Great Lakes if these carp are allowed to get through um, the dam in Joliet. So with this, we've, we've gone after the uh, Army Corps of Engineers as well as the federal government and state governments uh, in and around that area for funding to make sure that these fish do not get here. Between our commercial fishermen and our recreational fishermen, it'll just devastate the ecosystem and you have nothing. You're left with nothing. If we think zebra mussels and gobies were bad, this is way worse. Um, they eat everything, overeat, and they, then there's no uh, bait fish for in our lake, uh, pickerel, perch, black bass, uh, lake trout, salmon, and other great lakes. Um, so uh, they, it is devastating. There were six uh, resolutions that came forward, and these were passed by uh, the members, which we are one of them, and the board of directors. Uh, the first one was greater investment required to reduce nutrient impacts on the waterways. Support, uh, second one was support uh, for the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence collaborative strategy. Three, strengthening the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Sustainable Water Resources Agreement and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resources Compact for a Sustainable Blue Economy. Four was advancing interim measures at Brandon Road Lock, which I spoke about before uh, near Joliet, uh, to protect against Asian carp. Five, take action to reduce plastic waste in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River. And, and six was support for nature-based ecotourism along the Great Lakes coastlines and watersheds. Um, so I do have those six resolutions if anybody wants them. I can forward them to you if you want to read the full text of them. And if you have any questions, I ask you to email any one of us and we can get those back to you as, uh, as soon as we can. And I thank you very much. So we do have two staff that will be in the, in the coming uh, meetings be giving their um, report on, on a couple of seminars that they went to. I know the CAO and the clerk have something coming forward. So um, just for those people that don't know, if we do attend seminars as a council and, staff, and senior staff, that we always come back and give a report uh, with what we did and how our tax, fund, or tax dollars are being spent at these. But I'll tell you, FCM, there, there's some dollars to be had there for the community. Um, so I look at the investment that we do in, in sending us there and the fact that we can bring back money uh, to the city of Port Colborne through FCM initiatives, through the people that we meet, uh, through the pills that uh, Councillor Bruno spoke about. And I just look back to when we were in Banff, that turned out to be a little over a $7 million um, investment that we were able to get through an initiative that Gary and I basically uh, fell into through a gentleman that we met and we were able to speak to another gentleman and Gary brought it back to our hydro and lo and behold uh, we were able to receive uh, uh, seven million dollars plus some dividends over the years on the old NRBN so uh, these are very well uh, worth going to. Uh, staff responses? Anything from staff? I can actually do mine to me and I can do it quick. Oh okay. Sure. Yeah. So uh, through, your, through your worship to the rest of council, I also attended the FCM conference along with the three council members. Um, super quick, the uh, theme of the conference, as already mentioned, was building better lives. The sessions that I attended, um, in addition to the political keynotes by the federal party leaders and the trade show, which is a one-of-a-kind municipal trade show for, uh, for, for anybody who works at a, munici a municipality, council, or staff, uh, also attended a um, session on 5G technologies and municipalities, gender parity on municipal councils, risk management, 
and uh, fest festival fundraising, the one that the mayor alluded to. But the reason that I was at the conference cause, was because I was also at CAMA, which stands for the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators. That's a national association of CAOs. The theme, and it goes <clears throat> to whatever city FCM is at every year. So we're always uh, meeting in the same jurisdiction. And I happened to already be there, so I stayed for FCM. The theme of that conference was resiliency, leading in today's environment. The sessions, the highlight sessions, also a trade show, a little bit smaller than uh, FCM. There's about 250 delegates at this conference. There's over 2,000 at FCM. Uh, a session on resiliency, a session on populism, a session on building positive and respectful workplaces, and a session on political acuity, political acumen. So, and I'd be prepared to answer any questions if there are any. Do we got any questions for the CAO? Please email us if you do have anything. Um, anything from staff out front? Fire Chief. Thank you, Your Worship. If I could, a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is uh, the smoke alarm program or door-to-door -door program is well underway and has been for the last couple of months. Just a reminder to everybody with regards to smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. It's been a while since I spoke to council concerning that issue. I did file a report tonight with Council. One of the items in there was uh, uh, identifying the numbers of home and visits we did last year. Just under 1,000 homes were attended to last year by the fire department, and we hope to do the same for this year. That's our goal. And if I can, I'm kind of out of place saying this, but I'll, I'll thank our director for cutting, putting constant pressure on uh, the region and our railway to finally get the railway crossing fixed. It's been some number of, I'm going to be polite here, months to get fixed. Um, it has really done a lot of damage to our truck, in particular engine one causing brake damage uh, and various other suspension issues with that truck. So uh, we took a beating with regards to that crossing the way it was. Thank you, Chief. Anything else, staff? Dan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is just a public service announcement of the open house for the change to the CIP for the downtown. CIP that we're looking to include the property at the corner there of Elm and Charlotte. So the open house is this Thursday, 5.30. 4.30 4:30 to 5.30. 4.30 to 5.30. Thank you. Here uh, up third floor. Third floor. Council Chambers. Thank you. Uh, just one for Councillor Bruto. Uh, I did speak to our acting staff sergeant. They were out on... Barrick Road, they, they're going to keep an eye on it, and I know the signs were put up by staff for the no trucks, uh, uh, not a truck route. So, but they will be looking at that. So, if any of your constituents get a ticket, they were probably speeding. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that's it for staff. On to our items. Uh, item one uh, is Councillor Baggio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Fire and Emergency Services Department Report 2019-93, subject Fire Department Fee Schedule. Can I have a seconder to that? Councillor Clayla. Do you want the Chief to go first? Yes, please. Okay, Chief. Your Worship, uh, thank you. Uh, is it all right if I do it from this position, or would you rather go No, okay that's fine. Here? Okay. All right, um, I think everybody has in front of them uh, a copy of three slides, a very quick overview of the report, basically speaking to the fee schedule that the, uh, the city currently has in place with regards to fire services. The uh, fee schedules uh, started, were initiated in the late 80s, early 90s with regards to the fire service. Uh, they were first used as a deterrent for false alarms to uh, uh, fire alarm problems in, in municipal and or government buildings as well as private sector buildings. Uh, then it escalated into a, a cost recovery uh, portion of the budget each year and is looked upon as a revenue at this particular point in time. The Ministry of Transportation is the one who actually, and the report speaks to this, with regards to uh, the initial fees that were charged for accidents on uh, King and Queens highways. Uh, the MTO, or Ministry of Transport, does not have its own fire service, so they contracted uh, municipal fire departments to provide that service. Uh, that started in the 80s and uh, has continued through up and into and including today uh, over the years. That number has increased significantly from when it was the first initiated. The fees for service uh, is allowable under the Municipal Act and uh, certainly this municipality has them as, as all other municipalities do in this particular region. Uh, 
The fees were established, uh, are established through bylaw. Uh, councils uh, of the day have reviewed uh, re reports submitted by myself uh, with regards to fees, and they've uh, been changed over the years at the wish of council. Uh, fees for service were established, as I said earlier, in the 80s. The last dated, uh, updated was in 2016, and the fire department fees are now part of the city's overall fee schedule, which is updated on an annual basis. Up until the last couple of years, the fire department fees, as well as other department fees, were kind of on their own coming to council from time to time uh, through a report that was written by the director as directed by council. And um, it was decided through the uh, CAO and the director of finance of the day that we, we would bring it to council all encompassing. So when council would see the fees as they did this, this year, uh, the budget deliberations, all fees are dealt with at the same time. The, the fees that we currently have are attached to that report, um, which you have in front of you. And I'll just give you a brief idea of, and I know you do have the budget, in, uh, not necessarily in front of you, but certainly you had the, the opportunity to see the budget for this year and past years. Our total fees in uh, 2018, um, we had budgeted 8, 000, roughly $18,100. We collected a total of $23,144 last year. Uh, and, and this year we budgeted again $18,100 or $50. And so far this year we've collected $2,394 in fees uh, to, to date this year. The fees that we currently charge are broken out in a number of various areas, uh, some being emergency response. That's broken down to false alarms. Uh, people uh, cut gas lines uh, through not, improperly not having their property staked. When they do that, we charge them a fee for our services, that being the MTO rate, whatever that happens to be at the day. The rate that you see in your current bylaw actually is $470 because the bylaw says the MTO rate, the current MTO rate, which is just recently in, uh, increased to $470 per truck. And then there's other fees associated with uh, fire responses, depending on uh, if, if somebody's having an open fire and it gets out of control, we charge the MTO rate or an hourly rate for that. Um, and then we get into the fire prevention portion of it, and that breaks down various fees that we charge with regards to various fire prevention activities, with regards to inspections and things of that nature, whether it be a, a daycare, whether it be a, a refreshment vehicle, whether it be a, a uh, which is required, uh, requires a license through the clerk's office, and um, we charge a fee for that, uh, which is part of the licensing fee. The institutional fees we also have in there, depending on if it's an inspection that's required for a sale of a property or if it's required under provincial mandate, we have the, op the opportunity to charge fees for that. <coughs> and then there's, there's other fees such as a small building, when there's buildings sold, depending on the square footage, it's measured uh, and there's a, a per square foot uh, fee that's charged if a building is being sold. The same as if we do a file uh, search for a real estate agent or a lawyer, there's a fee for that. Um, and I'll touch on the one that's uh, kind of uh, out in there all the time is the bed and breakfast fee. There is a fee for that. And uh, then we go on to fire prevention. If there's uh, open burning site inspection, a fireworks vendor permit, propane license application, um, there's a process that has to go through that. We've added a fee for marijuana grow ops, a drug lab compliance inspection. We didn't have that up until the last couple of years. And then it goes on for, with regards to fire department assistance for a fire watch. We charge an hourly rate if we have to stand by at a fire waiting for uh, an insurance company to come and board the building up and things of that nature. We also have a clause within our fee schedule for extraordinary expenses. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, we had a, an individual who burned his, uh, tried to burn his house down a number of years ago. Uh, he wasn't successful. Um, we caught him at the scene and he was charged and I billed uh, him just over $18,000 for our services and uh, when they sold the property the city got paid and the way that works is if we bill and you don't pay the, it's automatically added to your taxes. Uh, we have had an occasion on a, on a couple of occasions where individuals have come to council and appealed the fee i.e. an open burn that's got out of control and got away from them and then we charge them a fee for our services to put the fire out they have come to council, and to date, council's always supported the uh, cost of that fee. It stays in place. That's a brief overview. Any questions? Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Councilor Bruno. 
Thank you, Worship. Uh, I'm not sure if this, I can direct this to the fire chief, perhaps even the CIO. One of the things we did at budget this time around was, and, and I think it's pretty, but I'd like to hear everybody else's comment on it, is I'm not so sure we need to be st uh, stuck to a format where fees come up in December for next year. I think the great thing about being a small municipality and a proficient staff is to be nimble and change those fees. Marina's now going to bring its fees forward at a different time. I look at one of the option here and I see uh, number three is uh, provide the fire chief with the means by which all fees are calculated that meet the wishes of council preferred. And four is continue with past practices using previously determined fees adjusted through inflation in consultation with council recommended. So I have a, a preferred and a and a recommended. What I'd like to see is that um, you know the chief there has four potential fees A through D. If a director feels that fees should be changed, to, to me it doesn't matter if it's September or January or the issue came up, let's react to it. Um, let's amend. So I, I'm wondering if the CAO can speak to what I think is boxed us in into uh, potentially doing fees at one time of the year rather than be flexible and do them when they seem most appropriate. Um, I'm sure some of them are, are routine ones, but I'd like to give the departments more flexibility to come forward. I'm wondering if the, there is a current methodology to do that. Sure, through your worship and counselor, Bruno, that's a great question. A few meetings ago, I did do a presentation on the principles I think, behind charging fees. But I don't know if I talked very much about the mechanics of charging fees. So the city does have a consolidated fee bylaw. What that means is there's one bylaw that's been passed by council, prior council, um, that considers all of the fees for all of the facilities, programs, and services that the municipality operates. It's a good thing, I think, for a couple of reasons. One of them is it's one-stop shopping for the resident or the end user, for, uh, user of our facilities programs or services. You only need to find the most current fee bylaw and you know what the fees are. I think it's also easier to administer for the directors and for the city clerk's department. We're not looking you know, through the archives for what are the current fees for a certain department. We know they're in the consolidated fee bylaw. But it doesn't have to be difficult to administer for council or staff either. Um, I can see a situation where a department you know, because of seasonality, does its fees at a different time of year. So we can do this. We can do amendments to this bylaw anytime. In fact, we could do it more than once per year. We could have one department have zero percent fee increases, and another department change their fees. We could have automatic increases for some or all fees based on an index: the construction price index, the consumer's price index, whatever we want. Um, and lastly, or I guess additionally, one thing we could have is a situation, I, I don't know if I already used the word seasonality, but it was in my head, um, where we want fees to come in at a certain time of year. So we could approve a fee increase to be implemented at some future date. For example, in January, we could approve a <coughs> increase in the ice rental fees to take place at the start of the hockey season in September or October, so that the associations that rent the ice and sell the uh, memberships to the, to the players can have some idea of how their costs are going to increase and make sure that they um, collect the appropriate amount of uh, participation fees, registration. So I, I think there's many tools at our disposal. I don't think it boxes us, us in. I think it can be to the contrary, to where it gives us more different opportunities. So I think what the fire chief is looking at today, I understand that there's some uh, the confusion there. I'll let him speak to that. I think what he means, not to put words in his mouth, is he does want the fees to be um, you know, to, to past practices, the inflationary fee increase to stay in place. He does want some <clears throat> guidance on what other fees, the preferred part is, what do we want to charge for? I think council has a chance today to look at the amount of the fees, to look at what we charge a fee for, and if council wants to continue charging a fee, and a few areas where we don't currently charge fees, but we could start. Um, but having said that, there could be fee changes in the summertime, there could be fee changes at the next budget, there could be no fee changes at all in terms of what the fee is that we charge. Thank you. Okay, Councillor? <clears throat> Councillor Wells? 
through your, your worship to uh, the fire chief, uh, I noticed in your, your fee structure between 2017, 18, and 19 that there has been no changes in the fees, actually. And I was just wondering if there's a reason for that and if there is a potential there where we could put an inflationary cost increase on those fees. Chief? Your Worship, uh, all I can tell you is that um, we've dealt with the fee schedule uh, in 16 with regards to a particular issue, which I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with. And um, there was a somewhat of a reluctance to increase any fees at that particular time. Uh, I can't speak to why the fees weren't increased this particular year from 18, other than they became part of the all-encompassing fee bylaw, which was done through uh, our former director of finance. Um, I believe that would be the reasoning behind that. Uh, possibly that uh, it wasn't necessarily an oversight, but I think there was somewhat of a reluctance to increase fees any further, only in the sense that uh, it always seems to be a sore point with individuals. So we were reluctant to do it. But again, unfortunately, Peter's not here to be able to answer that question, but it, it was done with the all-encompassing bylaw under one bylaw versus two or three different bylaws. Councilor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Chief. Um, do we have any fees for, uh, forget the, the word for it, uh, any type of fire alarm or fire appearance that you had to attend where the fire alarm was activated uh, not because of a fire <coughs> or any type of, um, yeah, something like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your False Worship. Alarm? Uh, False alarms, False yes. Alarm? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Negli yes, we do, Your Worship, yeah. through yourself to the Counselor. Uh, we do have a false alarm uh, fee. Normally what happens is um, we would charge 400, well, $470 is the new number that just came down from the province of Ontario for our MTO rate. That's per truck. And, and if it's a if it's a, in a hydrated area, we'd have four trucks respond. If it's outside of the hydrated area into a rural area, it would be five trucks. So we would charge $450 per truck, or $470 per truck, plus an administrative fee of $50 for oversight of that. Uh, that fee is only charged if there's more than one. We always give one uh, after an investigation and a letter of notification is given to them. If there's any further false alarms, they will be billed. Councillor? I just want to say sorry. I, I, I see that it was in here right, right in the front. <laughs> My report. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the Chief. Chief, is this philosophy still that we just want to recover our costs? Um, and if it isn't, um, for lack of a better term, is it just a money grab to get to, to get some extra cash? So, just like to know that. Chief? Your Worship, I'll try to answer this as carefully as I can. Um, I'm not always that way, but I'll try to be careful tonight. The, it, it's a form of revenue. First of all, there's a penalty uh, portion of it with regards to certain things that might occur, that being false alarms, things of that nature, uh, malicious false alarms and or out, out, out of control burning, those types of things. Uh, uh, the, the bill for MTO, the way that works, just so everybody in the room knows how it works in our viewing audience tonight, is we do not bill the people that have the accidents. We bill the province of Ontario. They determine through the police report who gets the bill for that action or that accident. Uh, they bill either both or three or two parties or one party in some cases the cost of our services on the, on the highways. As far as it being a revenue, um, to be honest with you, um, it, uh, again, this is where I'm going to try to be careful. Uh, I believe there, there's a push uh, in years past to try to find all sources of revenue uh, as a remedy to uh, increasing taxes. Uh, to a certain degree, not so much in the numbers that we're showing here because they're minuscule in size, but the reality of the situation is some municipalities make a lot of money off charging fees, larger municipalities in particular. So yes, there's a revenue uh, that comes into play. And as the CAO alluded to at his previous uh, presentation to Council, 
it would be nice if staff had a formula that we could actually sit down and calculate all of our fees from beginning to end. Nobody, to the best of my knowledge, has come forward and provided that opportunity to us. So the way, way it's happened over the years in past is we, when I say we fire chiefs and fire officials, uh, sit and talk to one another, compare notes, talk about some fees. There's, and I believe Councillor Bruno alluded to the fact we necessarily don't want to be the highest, we don't necessarily want to be the lowest at a previous council meeting. And that's the route a lot of us take. We try not to be the highest, we try not to be the lowest, we try to find common ground. But I'll tell you right now, my research shows that nobody is the same on everything. There's changes depending on the needs, wants and desires and the demand for the service. There's flexibility across the entire region of Niagara and probably throughout the province of Ontario, having worked in a number of municipalities as I have. So it, it shouldn't necessarily be looked upon as a revenue, but quite frankly, it is in some cases, simply because there's an opportunity to make some money for <coughs> services that are provided for a particular purpose that not everybody benefits from. And, and CAO talked about that in his presentation. Uh, there's two ways of looking at this. We're gonna provide this service at no cost to anybody, or those that use that service are gonna pay a fee in one sort or another, whether it be an hourly rate as may be determined by the MTO or a rate that's set by council, and a report comes forward to council from time to time uh, identifying those fees, and then council has to make the determination as to whether or not they're fair. Okay, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Well, I'm glad you said that you were uh, being careful there and walking the line because I think your report certainly does with that three and four look. I mean, as a counselor, I look to staff and directors as having intimate knowledge with the subject, lots of background, bringing that forward in recommendations, maybe defeated, maybe amended, maybe turfed. But at the end of the day, I'd like to see the process for your fees and just when I look at three and four, I say, well, the fire chief and his department should bring forward recommendations and we pass them. And so I see the means that you refer to, and maybe you could explain it, provide the fire chief with the means by which all fees are calculated that meet the wishes of council. Um, I think that's what a report is about every week. All of you, your expertise bringing forward what you think is in the best interest of the city and the department. And I, I, this fee issue seems to be um, sometimes a bit at odds to the regular norm. So, I mean, I'd like to see the option is the fire chief bring forward recommendations um, on fees, period. Um, so, I don't know if you can elaborate on the item Roman numeral, numeral three and four, but I, I think this could be a pretty straightforward process each year. And if now you're, you know that it doesn't have to automatically occur um, in December or January, then let's bring forward a recommendation including um, possible additional fees from time to time. Not tonight, you may wanna talk about A and D at different times of the year, but. I guess I'm looking for some a simplified version of what we've made complicated. Chief? Your Worship, if I could. Uh, with regards to point number three, uh, I've said a number of times that uh, whenever you bring forward a report with a fee in it, you're always open to criticism, gay or nay, one way or the other. Uh, and as I said just a couple of minutes ago, it would be really nice if we if we had a mechanism by which we could say you got to fill in this blank, this blank, this blank to get that number. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen, and it, and it's really difficult to do, because in some people's minds, whether it be people watching tonight or whether it be people sitting in front of me tonight, uh, some people are of the opinion that. We as staff are already here, so why do we charge any fee for our time and or our vehicles, our office space, our, our paper, our pens, our training? All of those things have been discussed by councils in the past. Should they or should they not be included? Uh, and there's all, we're always open to debate as to whether or not we're going to be able to charge a fee for our time and our services. Um, and quite frankly, that's never occurred and we've never been given a firm direction. Thus, the fees that have been in front of you 
a number of times, not yourselves, but councils in, over the last number of years. And I should just say one other thing that did occur during the course of the last 10 years. Uh, we had a master fire master planning committee, which was made up of two members of council, the CAO, the mayor, a uh, member of the public, a member of the Firefighters Association, both full-time and volunteers, a member of industry. We sat down. In fact, there's a couple members of council sitting here tonight that were part of that on my, my right and my left. Uh, <laughs> and I believe the mayor himself was on council when this, all, this whole process started. Mm -hmm. And we discussed all of the fees that we had. We reviewed them all. And it came to council uh, 2007 and again 2000, I think it's six times it's been to council since 2004. And a determination was made that the fees of that day were appropriate and they've built on since then. And you're absolutely right, Councillor, in the sense that, and I do identify within this report, there are other areas we could charge fees for, but they're not necessarily really popular. And, and that's an issue that Council may have to determine in a future time. You know, and I'll give you an example. Uh, vulnerable occupancy certification, which is now required and which has happened over the last three to four years, requires a lot of staff time to go through a process to certify our seniors' homes that they meet the requirements of the Ontario Fire Code on an annual basis. There's a test that has to take place. They have to submit a plan, which is signed off by my fire prevention officer, and then it comes to me for my review. Um, we had to take courses and we're trained to be able to review those and make sure that they meet all the requirements. Then there's a test that takes place. Sometimes a retest has to take place. Those are the types of fees that we have yet to start to charge. Community living is another area that a number of municipalities charge thousands of dollars a year. We've been reluctant to do that because of the clientele involved and trying to treat them with respect because we know, as you know, that any fee we charge ends up going to the people using that facility and or that, that agency. So we've been kind of reluctant to bring that forward to council, but I'd be more than happy to bring it forward to council and, and if that is a direction council chooses. Uh, I'm not prepared to do it just on my own, but if council were to say to me tonight or at another time through the CAO or the CAO were to decide, let's look for more revenue or more opportunities to charge for services, by all means, we could bring a report to council and then you could decide whether or not you wanted to charge a fee that I might recommend versus a fee that you might have in mind. Um, it's hard to charge just an hourly rate because sometimes on vulnerable occupancies, there's as many as six staff, our staff involved, our duty crew, myself, my deputy, my fire prevention officer, we're all involved in that. So you can't set a flat fee. You could, but maybe not an accurate and wouldn't capture your money back. So the reality is, I, I don't know, I think we've just gotten into the position where we now can bring it forward to council at one time, deal with it at one night. It's always been all over the place. I would do it one month, somebody else would do it another month. I think this will work, and I think the way it would work is that we automatically increase it by the cost of living, as council has decided in the past to do. Um, and from time to time, if a new fee were to be needed, we could bring that forward to council at that time. I think that's possibly the best way to do it. I think it's easier for staff to be able to uh, manage one bylaw versus a number of bylaws. Thank you, Chief. Councillor? Well, I guess at the end of the day, I'll come back to the fact that you've got two recommendations there are preferred and recommended. I see that your report would, I mean, if you're looking for directions to, to say um, cost of living plus any of your ad hoc recommendations, I can support that. But at the end of the day, I think the two are merged. When you come and bring an annual uh, fee increase, maybe it's more then because it's a new one than inflation. Maybe you want to change one that's been there in the past. I just see this as um, your report for your departments. I mean, you know that marketplace. You deal with all other 12 municipalities. You know what their fees are. I'm just looking for every department head to bring forward the recommended fees and we'll debate it. And I, so, so I'm for the, um, the cost of living, but honestly, I think when you bring forward your report, you're gonna have the temperature out there of whether that's gotten too high or will have it. But at the end of the day, between the two of us, we've got to deal with these matters on a financial level and whether these uh, four items need to come forward. I, 
I don't see it in my expertise, and perhaps the rest of the folks here, as to whether vulnerable occupancy certification should have a fee and what it would be. Because I'm having a hard time figuring out what that even definition is. And that's why I look to staff. So I'm, I'm not for it having to come. I'm for the CAO's solution that it comes when you need it. If you feel it's necessary, bring it forward. It might be bold. It might get turned down. It might get passed. It might be amended. But let's get department heads bringing forward their fee schedule, and we'll debate it. Um, plain and simple. I mean, we've got four recommendations there, and the recommendation to me should be on an annual basis or, or whenever, as directed by the director, needs to bring forward a fee proposal. He does so. It's at least minimum once a year, and, and we deal with it. So for tonight on this one, I, I'm looking for a merger of your three and four. You're the chief. Um, if the principle is that uh, inflation is there, which I believe is right, and I'm happy to put that forward, but, but, but you bring forward your recommendation. So I'm for the merger of your item three and item four. I don't know what others feel. So, Councillor, um, do you want to put forward... Um, that is an amendment to the original motion, which was to, to receive. Um, we need a motion to, to bring that forward. So if you want to do some wordsmithing with regards to those two. Well, I just need one quick make, answer from the Quite chair. honestly, I think four picks up everything three says. Yep. But it adds what Councillor Wells talked about, about the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. I mean, I, I think the chief doesn't need us to create the means. Correct. The chief creates the means. Yes brings those forward here, we debate them. Yep. So, I mean, we can continue with what we've been doing over the last number of years, uh, which came out of actually our committee, uh, a number of those issues. Um, and we, we use the unjust of inflation. To me, I think that picks up three in and itself. I do too. So if you want to leave four as the motion. I'm fine with that. Then it gives the chief for next year, and if he wants to bring in any of the four above or whatever new things or delete a fee, yep. then he does that in his annual review. So he can bring forward his annual review and say, this year I want to introduce A, B, or C. Exactly. I mean, that's what the chief is here to do, or the fire department, because it's not just the chief, it's his staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you do that as an amendment to the recommendation, just make item four, amend it so that item four be approved. That's what I'm saying, because all we're doing is receiving it. We have to amend to include option four. Option four. Mm -hmm. That will receive and include option four. Is that fine? Yeah. Okay. So as an amendment, I got Councillor Bruno moving it. Can I have a seconder? Councillor uh, Beauregard. So any questions on that one? All those in favor? That's carried. Any any further questions to the chief? So we're gonna receive this with the recommendation. Uh, of item four. Everybody understands the motion as amended. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, item number two, Councillor Wells. Subject, Energy Conservation and Demand Management uh, Plan 2019-2024. Can I have a seconder to this? Councillor Demeray? Councillor Wells? Okay. Um, it's a real simple one. Um, and it's uh, through you, Your Worship, to, um, um, to the author of this report, uh, Darlene. Um, in regards to uh, community centers, I didn't see the community centers inside the report. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the community, can you clarify the community? Oh, the um, 
Shirkston and Bethel. Yes. Uh, that's because uh, we actually don't pay the uh, utility bills for those facilities. It's in their lease agreement that they're responsible for the utilities. So they are outside the scope of our, our control because it's, it's them that pays them. Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, and you have a short presentation? We have a, we will keep, we, we're it's really long tonight, so we're going to zip through really fast. Thank you. Um, I promise. I brought um, mayor and council and staff. I have brought my uh, student, summer student, May Lannan with me. So I'm going to do the front half and the introduction, and May is going to finalize with the uh, the plan itself, which she's worked, started last summer when she was my student, and she has been working diligently to get it done by the July 1st deadline. Um, so to give you some background, what we're doing, um, basically the regulations have changed. There used to be the Green Energy Act, it was repealed. Now this is all under the Electricity Act. So once every five years, we have to update our conservation demand management plan, and annually we have to present the uh, Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report. So the plan gives us guidance for the city, um, how we're going to do our energy management. It helps us reduce our energy consumption and the environmental impacts associated with energy consumption. And it does evolve. It's not a, it's not a set in stone document, it's a living document, and it will be uh, modified as uh, we progress through the five years. So vision statement, um, this again, this original plan was in 2014. The vision statement has not changed since 2014. We just incorporated it into our new 2019-2024 plan. And the same with our commitment. Basically, we're committing, the city is committed to energy reduction. We're committed to um, responsible energy management. And we're going to, of course, comply with our legislation. And we're going to continually improve. So before we could establish where we want to go with our targets for 2019 to 2024, we had to analyze. When the first plan was done in 2014, we didn't have a lot of data. Um, so we now know, uh, based on 2011 to 2017, uh, these charts are showing you the e kilowatt hours, or equivalent kilowatt hours, um, and how it's broken down by the different facilities here in the city. Um, we, this is the intensity, which is how much e kilowatt hours is per square meter of uh, property. And the reason we do that is when we have large facilities such as the valet center, um, it's not fair because uh, to compare them directly, because of course it uses the most um, energy, uh, natural gas and electricity, out of all the facilities in the city, just because of its size. Um, it's over 13,000 square meters in size. So instead, we look at how much energy it's consumed, or each area has consumed, and divide it by the square footage. So the gray area is actually our museum and tourism sector. And uh, although this includes all of the museum uh, buildings, the marina, the Roselawn Center, these are a lot of them um, are older heritage buildings. So it's 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 understandable that they're not as energy efficient as um, in the orange. This is our um, recreation, that's the Valley Health and Wellness, Wellness Center, which is a LEED Gold certified uh, facility. So this is what we expect to see. But it gives us something to work on because we know that this is kind of the baseline and where we need to maybe focus our efforts. So I want to give some highlights from the 2014-2019 uh, 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 plan. Uh, we've actually had some really great success stories. Uh, with regards to energy supply management, which is one of the um, areas, focus areas of our plan, we did explore conservation measures and funding opportunities, and we had a great relationship with Canadian Niagara Power, our hydro supplier, over the past five years. And they actually got us funding for a roving energy manager for a one-year term back, I think it was 2014, that individual came to the city once a week for a year, completely free to us, and he uh, helped us navigate the grants, he brought opportunities to our attention, and it was a very great opportunity. Um, and we continued to have that relationship with our, with our provider. So the big highlights is a lot of the energy management we've done at some of our facilities. So in 20, you'll see that there is actually lighting in here twice, and I will explain. 2012-2013, we retrofitted uh, through the Save on Energy Small Business uh, Incentive Program. We did um, all of our T12 light bulbs to T8 fluorescent lights. It didn't apply to facilities like City Hall at the time because it was for small businesses. But in that one, uh, during that project, we did had a 21% decrease in our normalized e kilowatt hours uh, per square meter, and that's taking um, your weather into consideration. We had $27,000 of retrofits done for only $12,000 at all the facilities. 
In 2015, 2016, we did our streetlight LED retrofit. And that was every streetlight in the city, we went to LEDs. Um, the projected cost was just over a million dollars and our incentive was just over $220,000. And we we're saving about a 41% reduction in costs. So that's not only our um, reduction in energy, um, uh, energy costs, but also maintenance costs because they're all new and they last a lot longer. 2016, we did HVAC upgrades at uh, Rose Lawn and the library, and we got a 10% decrease at Rose Lawn in our normalized e kilowatt hours uh, per square meter and 20% at the library. And we got $6,000 in incentive for those two retrofits. And in 2018, since the technology has come to the point where it is now, we are actually in the midst of a, an LED retrofit. Um, our Canadian Niagara Power folks um, approached us in 2017 and said, hey, would you like to do a, uh, uh, your own self-directed uh, retrofit? We'll give you LED lights for as many facilities as you want. You have a year to put them in. We said, all right, let's go. We got our tally sheets from our energy audits. And in 2018, we, uh, 20, 2018, we, we replaced 2,400 bulbs, $18,600 worth of work for only $3,000. So it was amazing. So every facility <coughs> in the city, except for Valet uh, Health and Wellness Center, has been retrofitted at this point. We currently have three applications in through the uh, Save on Energy program through Canada Niagara Power. We have completed one of the programs at Valet. We've replaced 900 um, bulbs and ballasts with LEDs. Um, and we have, uh, I believe, the work at the pool is starting this week, I believe. And we also got incentive for that. And there's one other one that we're hoping to get, and it's for replacing the um, lights at the arenas, at the actual ice rinks. And that's another 1,200 light bulbs. Um, so that is over $80,000 worth of work, and we've, if, if we get all three, and $23,000 in incentives. So we've really managed to get a lot of work done. Oh, and the payback is less than a year for all the LED bulbs. So it it's really is fantastic. We're really working on it. And of course, we can't evaluate what we've done until 2020 because we 2018 was a transition year. So we're very excited to see next year's numbers. And, base, and the other part that we've done, our highlights, is we have done ongoing energy audits of key city facilities. Um, those of you that have been on council before or in the past may remember me coming forward about uh, some of the students I've had. Uh, we have, through Niagara College and through some of my summer students, we have uh, audited all of our large facilities and we're actually in our second year of doing a lot of the facilities. So that helps us identify areas where we need to continue improving and also lets us celebrate the successes uh, that we've had when we can go to staff and say, hey, look at what you guys did. This is awesome. Um, and that's part of the energy awareness campaign. That was one of May's tasks last year. Uh, is she took all the data we had from the audits and met with each of the facilities, presented the data. They were very enthusiastic, very happy to hear back, and they gave her lots of ideas which have been incorporated into the plan. And with respect to renewable energy, um, previous um, plan, we made a commitment that we weren't going to pursue renewable energy just for the sake of getting a check every month. Our approach was going to be um, more to take ownership of our own energy consumption and if we could offset it at all, we would definitely look into it. So we did get more funding, again, from, from uh, through the Save on Energy program, um, through uh, investigating combined heat and power at the Valley Health and Wellness Center. Councilor Bruno was in his private sector and then and he actually hooked us up. So we ended up getting uh, $60,000 worth of studies done for free, 100% free, um, and to see if we could do combined heat and power to offset our electrical consumption at Valet and some of our heat as well. Unfortunately, the, the uh, system that was proposed was a little more costly than they thought, and the payback was a little longer than they thought. So at the time, it wasn't, ended up not being a recommended alternative, uh, but we do continue wanting to look more into renewables as we move forward. And now I'm going to pass it over to May. All right. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about our goals, targets, and objectives in regard to our new plan. So our overall goals for the plan include um, the city providing leadership so that we can promote um, a culture of energy conservation throughout our city facilities. Um, we're also hoping to reduce our energy consumption as well as our greenhouse gas emissions um, while continuously improving um, the efficiency of our facilities. And then we will continue to seek opportunities to use renewable energy where feasible and practical. 
moving forward. So this brings me to our quantitative goals, and each of these targets are in relation to electricity. Um, the reason being that we have the most control over electricity consumption than our natural gas. Natural gas seems to be more um, attributed to weather. So our 10% reduction in annual energy intensity by um, 2024 will come from most of our facility management. Um, we're also hoping to have a 25% reduction in electricity contributed to our computer servers, so we'll be monitoring that over the next five years. Um, our 200,000 kilowatt hour reduction from electricity consumption is going to be through, um, hopefully, um, energy awareness campaigns and reducing energy waste, uh, which should all contribute to a 15% reduction of yearly um, kilowatt hours per um, heating degree days, as Darlene spoke about um, earlier, that takes weather out of the consideration, so changes in weather won't impact how we move forward with our goals. So we have seven uh, categories of objectives, so I'm just going to hit the highlights on all of them quickly. Um, our main um, objective for energy plan management will be our energy conservation committee and um, meeting annually or as frequently as needed. Um, this committee will be chaired by Darlene Sutter, our environmental um, compliance supervisor, as well as staff from all of our facilities, and we're also asking for a member of council to sit on this committee. Um, at the end. As far as energy supply management goes, um, Darlene spoke earlier about our uh, collaboration with Save on Energy, and a lot of our um, knowledge came from uh, Na Canadian Niagara Power's conservation demand management team. However, moving forward, this um, team will no longer be employed by Canadian Niagara Power, so our um, chances for finding funding opportunities will probably be a little bit less and a little bit more difficult to find in the future. Um, facility energy management is where um, the majority of our obje objectives will be. Um, as you can see, a lot of them pertain to carrying out maintenance improvements and creating um, list inventory lists so that we can stay on top of our appliances as well as um, the maintenance of those appliances. Um, I'd also like to speak a little bit about our audits that Darlene touched on briefly because those audits were um, essential in creating a baseline for us um, in understanding our energy. But in more complex systems like at the Valet Center, uh, that kind of would need to be outsourced if we really need to want to understand that properly because it's a little bit above um, our understanding of energy management. Um, as far as organizational integration goes, this will be our energy um, awareness campaigns with our staff and hopefully helped by our energy conservation committee. Um, communication and awareness throughout the city is going to be um, essential for this plan being a success. Um, in regard to energy data management, we've done fairly well in um, our annual reporting of energy and using our energy planning tool to uh, sort all of our uh, electricity and natural gas usage. Um, we do have a suggestion that we implement a policy that all of our uh, leases uh, use energy efficient appliances as well as that any of our new appliances that we purchase our Energy Star grade. And then speaking to renewable energy, that we continue to investigate this area um, when it's feasible and practical. Then I'd just like to talk a little bit about the evaluation of our plan. Uh, the impl implementation uh, will help in making sure that our strategies are centralized in our energy around energy consumption and uh, monitoring and reporting. We oops, we do our annual um, greenhouse gas reports, um, 
mainly done by students, which flows into how we review and evaluate. We're hoping that on a yearly basis, we can evaluate the plan and track how far we've come with regard to our goals and see why we are like may have come short, why we're succeeding, because again, this plan's not meant to be static. It's meant to change as our um, understanding of energy management changes. And I think that's all we wanted to cover. If there are any questions? Okay, counselors, any questions? Seeing none, just a couple comments, ladies. Um, it's good to see that um, two councils ago, and then the last council uh, took on the project, was that 20, 2014, uh, our cost to operate our street lights was $327,091, and then last year um, was $191,909. So over the time that we started that project and finished replacing all the uh, street lights, it was an overall savings of 135000 and change, which is a difference of about almost 42%. In cost, so that was a project well worth it. Um, that was one. And the other one I had was with regards to the Valley Health and Wellness Center and the fact that how technology changes even quicker. Because we went out for the silver lead when we went to that, we received gold lead, and we tried to get the most efficient, especially lighting in this case that you guys are talking about, at the time. It's still efficient, but now there's better stuff that come out. So any time that you guys can do that and saves us uh, money on our facilities is is uh, I think is an, uh, uh, a way that this council is going to move forward uh, with these projects. Because I think a lot of them pay themselves off in a very short period of time. I mean, I replaced um, a little over 100 bulbs, uh, fluorescent bulb tubes in my office, and my savings over the last two years has actually more than paid for my original costs. So, and that was a program actually through Canadian Niagara Power. So, uh, what you guys are doing are great. Um, so, council, we are looking for one appointment to this of a councillor. Is there anybody willing to do this? Put up their hand. Councillor Clayloff. All right, so we have a councillor that's come forward. Uh, any more questions on this? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Thanks, ladies. Uh, Council, I'm going to skip three and come back to it. I'm going to go right to eight because we do have the proponent here, um, and it is almost 9:30. Uh, so, Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. Planning and Development Department, Planning Division Report Number 2019-85. Subject: Recommendation Report for Official Plan Amendment D090119 and Zoning Bylaw Amendment D14. 0319 170 Welland Street and accompanying memo re Ministry of Environment D6 guidelines. Okay, seconder for that, <coughs> Councillor Beauregard, Councillor Demare. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, I do have a few questions with regard to the guidelines, <laughs> and uh, I do uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Akalina Dan. Thank you for. Um, putting out the, the memo uh, with regard to the DOT guidelines, but it didn't really help me understand how um, we can say 20 meters is sufficient when 70 is actually the possible area of influence when we don't actually know the end use. So we don't know what the property is going to be used for. How can we possibly protect the community by saying 20 meters? That's what I know, it plus effects, sorry. Dan? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Demaray, the 70 meters is the influence area. That's not an area that it has to be set back as. It's saying that anything within 70 meters is something to consider, any impact of that. It recommends that at least a minimum setback should be 20 meters. When you look at the actual uses permitted in the light industrial zone, the only one that raises any concerns with staff is the fact of outside storage. Outside storage is permitted in the zoning bylaw currently right now in the interior side yard or rear yard. So to address the storage outside, the recommendation was to have a fence nine feet tall. Councillor. Thank you. Uh, again, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Akalina. Okay, Dan, I understand what you're saying. Um, 
what I would be concerned with, let's just say that it's a type of outside storage that would concern me. Um, we right now have uh, gypsum piles that are farther along, uh, you know, far more than the 20 meter setback in from the community, and they're heavily influencing the community. So a fence, and there are fences involved there. I don't know that a fence will have anything to do with this, and, and the gypsum piles are at least watered down to, to form crust, but still they have an impact on the community. Um, what if a company very similar to, to say, Snyder's Dock Services purchased, uh, purchased ore metals? What happens then if they want to store some of their products on that dock, extend the dock out? I mean, if you, if you notice, the, um, some of the, those materials are being stored, stored much closer to Welland Street than they ever have before. So there are certainly concerns, and I just wonder how you would protect that with just a fence. Dan? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Demaray. The actual storage on the property, if it is going to be stored with gypsum, I can't confirm that it would be. When you look at the uses in the light industrial zone, given the fact you have an existing building there and some land surrounding the building, we believe a nine meter fence would be sufficient because the gypsum, if it's blowing, you can assume that it's going to blow and move along the ground before it actually hits the neighboring properties. Okay. Um, nine feet, you mean, Dan, not nine meters. Nine feet, sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was a little confused on that as well. About three Thank meters. About three meters. <laughs> but again, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to you, Mr. Aguilina. Um, all right, so a nine-foot fence. Right now there is, uh, I believe it's probably about a six or seven foot fence at least, uh, farther, down, farther south along Welland Street, and it does nothing to stop anything from moving around. It's still blowing onto the community. Um, would we have control as to what would be stored on that dock if they are, or on that, that land? Because when you're talking about a building, the building is only in the north corner of the, of the property. There's still quite a bit of property south of that building, and that's the storage area that I would be most concerned with. So, uh, and that leaves just nothing but a roadway and homes. Dan? Through Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Dunbarry, I can't comment on what type of fencing is further south. If the fencing is going to, if this only bylaw is approved, the fencing would be board on board. It would be a solid fence. It wouldn't be chain link. Okay, thank you. That, that would probably be more protective. So you would still get that effect, and I forget what it's called, but from the old Inco days, I do remember them describing this effect where the wind comes up and picks the material up and it creates this, this flow and shoots it over. It just means it misses the houses on Welland Street and gets the houses on Fair Street. It just it drops down a little bit farther along, but it's still going to drop the materials. That's what concerns me is that we can't control what it would be stored on the property. That's what I want to see happen. Okay, Dan. Uh, Mr. Mayor, my only comment is that if council has a concern with storage, then that's something that could be prohibited on the property. And then if you want to have storage, you may say that anything but gypsum or any of material that's going to cause a concern, if you're going to have storage, just allow storage to be in association with a use on the property. Whether it be any type of machinery or any other storage that would be accessory to what use is permitted on the property. So if council has a concern with storage of gypsum, then to be something that you can, through the bylaws, specifically say that is not permitted on the property. Okay. So again, thank Counselor? you. Councillor? Through you again, thank you, Mr. Beer. Um, oh, Dan, that, that, that's actually the what I was kind of hoping you would say. Um, so very much like we said that we didn't want to see adult entertainment or, or medical marijuana facilities, uh, we could also say we don't want outside storage. Correct? That's the direction of council, Mr. Mayor. Then it's something we can bring back to council with the bylaw okay. amendment, or we can amend it this evening. Yeah, or it could be this evening. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'd actually like to come back to this after everybody's had a chance to speak. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. It wasn't my question, but just to elaborate on Councilor uh, Demery, I think that the word outside storage is too broad a term. I would hope. Because if, certainly if it was, I mean, you have Allied Marine up the road, and if they were storing things that were just steel or low-level ground or underneath nine feet, 
I'm sure you wouldn't want to necessarily disallow that. I, I don't know when you get back up to speak if you want to talk about things that are airborne, perhaps. Uh, anyways, my, my question to you, Mr. Aquilina, is um, with this particular property being existing, um, the use changes, does site plan control can it come into play? And while I'm standing up, uh, the rest of the area that we've changed from parkland to light industrial, as businesses develop there, would they be subject to site plan control in light industrial? Dan? Could you ask the mayor to Council Bruno? Yes, any development is subject to site plan control. So, so in that case, you could implement berming, tree lining, things like that over and above the fence that you've got in here, correct? When that occurs. So that's something in the future that we can add to, correct? Yes. Thank you. Councilor Borgard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question was going to be about site plan control and whether or not that could address uh, Councilor Demaray's concerns. Is, is that possible? Mr. Mayor to Councillor uh, Beauregard, yes, it would be something we could look at depending upon what use is actually proposed on the property as to where it is proposed and if there's any room available on the property for berming around the property, I mean around the actual storage of gypsum or any other product that can blow or cause concern, that'd be something that we can address. Maybe it's a role of, well, it could be a row of uh, landscaping, solid landscaping that may block gypsum blowing or any other product. Okay. Anything else, Councillor Wilson? Councillor Walls. Uh, through you, Mayor, uh, to uh, Dan and possibly the rest of Council. Um, it's obvious that this is boiling down to this minimum separation distance uh, in regards to the classifications of the industries. Uh, and we have a differentiation between um, our classifications of the cities of light industrial versus the ministry's classifications. And in the report, it, it states that there's only one, one deviation between the two, when in actuality there are a number of different deviations between a class one and a light industrial or a class one and a class two by the ministry's definitions. Um, outside storage is just one of them. So the ministry requires any outside storage to be classified as a class two industry. And a class two industry requires a minimum separation distance of 75 meters. So we're taking a side uh, and trying to minimize this, the, the impact of, that these residents will be having uh, adjacent to this property by going to a lighter standard of industry than what the Ministry of the Environment in their D6 classification requires. So in my interpretation of that is that we have to, uh, we have to go by a class two land use compatibility with a minimum separation of 70 meters. Um, that, that's the Ministry's re requirements. And the ministry requirements are what we follow by the provincial policy statement, by our official plan. And in fact, the region in, in their response and their comments that came back to us, uh, as you have reported in there, Dan, uh, state that uh, they should, they need to be followed. Um, that the, um, bear with me here for a second. Um, in the region's report, uh, that um, they, I lost my page, sorry. Um, the region uh, on your page four of your, your report states that um, uh, the comment by the region is that um, suggests that uses that do not meet D6 should not be permitted uses on the, uh, as uses on the property. Um, so we have to address that. And the way we address that minimum distance is by um, providing uh, through the region, and that's what they've said, that they recommend that the city provide rationale to support the proposed uses when we don't know what the uses are going to be. And so then it goes, it goes on that the, uh, my understanding is the regional official plan uh, will have to be amended in order to, to change the zoning from, from park over to industrial. And if that's the case, 
then my understanding as well that a regional uh, comprehensive review um, and in, of the uh, has to be done and that the employment land strategy needs to be completed as well. Uh, these are things that I've, I've picked up from some discussions with the region. Um, so at this point in time, I, I think that we are um, a little bit premature on being able to be approve this uh, because there's a there's a conflict between the whether we use the 20 meters or we use the 70 meters and we haven't done the studies and the studies aren't presented uh, in order to substantiate the 20 meters uh, as being uh, viable either by the study of of the types of industries or by the um, by the types of uh, um, mitigation measures you would be putting in place and, and I'll these are directly from the D6 um, um, documents that buffers in many cases cannot be expected to eliminate all conflicts but should reduce the contaminant discharges and other compatibility problems to a trivial, trivial impact level and the key words are trivial impact level. Land use mitigation measures are to be based on the facility's scale and design and the duration, frequency and the type of discharges or impacts. We don't know those, so we can't even assess those. Uh, a buffer must be appropriately designed, constructed, and maintained, bearing in mind the overall intended purpose. Well, again, we don't know the purpose, so we don't know how to design that fence, and a privacy fence is not a designed fence. Um, section 4.3 uh, relates to other contaminants other than air contaminants, as uh, Councillor Bruno and Councillor Demery uh, said with regards to the gypsum, there's noise, there's air, uh, there's light. Um, so in that, in section 4.3.1 of D6, noise and other air contaminants uh, states that a berm or a wall will have usually a very little or no effect on the control of noise and may not be adequate for dust, odors, gaseous air contaminants, and distance is the only effective buffer. Uh, it also goes on to state that privacy fences have little to no effect uh, with regard to reduction of noise or air pollution. So the, the D6 guidelines are very specific and they have a lot of conditions in there that, that, that need to be supported by scientific data or data that's, that's studied. So unless we do that, I think we're premature in being able to vote on this. Thank you, Councillor. Dan, any comments? Mr. Mayor, my only comment would be then if the council is concerned about storage on the property, then don't permit storage that could cause a concern in relation to the D6 guidelines because some storage is not going to have an impact about in the need for separation. Like if you have a use that's permitted and you're going to store material as part of your business, the D6 guideline is not going to have that great of a concern for it. If it's material that's stored accessory to a use on the property. Thank you. Councillor. Again, uh, through your mayor to Dan, it's not only storage outside. Uh, one of the differences is shift work. Class one, in the, uh, class one category by the Ministry of the Environment does not allow shift work. So from that perspective, they, you know, that would have to be another condition that would be imposed upon that, that zone, that there'd be no shift work. Uh, outside storage not only is from contaminants, but from noise. Vehicles being on the outside, moving material around, um, that's going to have an impact uh, there that, as I said, the, uh, the Ministry of the Environment, through their experience and, and years of, of dealing with these issues, have said that there's very little chance that a privacy fence is going to work and provide that. Um, so there are many conditions here that have to be in there and I don't think tonight that we can nail those conditions down uh, to amend this. So, again. Thank you. Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to Ms. Angelina. Um, I, I take on board what Councillor Wells says and they're all very valid concerns. My concern tonight is, is that we've got one property owner who a couple of weeks ago we... Um, appear to have come to the conclusion, and it was in the report, that there was um, a misplay, a misunderstanding, a non-notification of this change. 
I want to turn our attention back to that tonight we're dealing with a property that may or may not have been uh, zoned out from under someone. Council in its wisdom decided to rectify that. I'm just wondering through you to Mr. Aquilina, uh, given what I've said in council's previous decision, um, does that property then innately have some existing use options because effectively we've allowed it to um, now be zoned what it was zoned for and used for and grandfathered for and I'm very concerned that we walk a different route on this if we were to uh, change the potential of that property and I don't know if you can speak to that in any general terms not necessarily legal. Dan? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bruno, the fact right now, the use on the property is non-conforming. The zoning was changed by Council in 2014 or 15, I believe, to go to parks to remove the light industrial zoning on the property to match the East Waterfront Secondary Plan. The fact is, right now, an individual can operate the use that was on the property. To now go towards a new use, it opens up the whole regime of policies. And that's what the concern is being raised by Councillor Demery and Wells. The fact of the D6 guidelines that talk about allowing a zone change when you have residential being a sensitive land use adjacent to the property. Councillor? Is that existing use light industrial or just the narrow use of what it was. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council Bruno, right now a non conforming use is narrow. It's not light industrial in nature, it's only the salvage yard that is the non conforming use on the property. Thank you. Okay, Councilor. Councilor Borgard? Yeah. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to actually Councilor Wells. You, uh, you, the information you brought kind of, when I was listening to you, kind of put us in like a catch 22 sort of circumstance. Mm -hmm. You're saying that we need to know what industry is going there, but we won't know what industry is going there until the property is sold for an industry in order, well, yeah, to know who's going to actually take on that property. So I'm just wondering what is, with the information you brought forward, what, what's your recommendation or, 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 or you can, or Dan, I don't know if you want to comment to this. I'm, I'm just kind of lost here and would like to, more explanation as to your points, I guess. Dan? My only comment, Mr. Mayor, is that the fact is the light industrial zone that we put in place has certain uses on the property. Are those uses a concern with the neighboring property owners? Perhaps. We, knew, we heard tonight potential gypsum causing concern. We heard the fact there could be ships in work my position is is that even though the fact that the property changed zoning that's what council did but of the day now to go back to what was there before is a concern because we have issues now to address on the provincial planning side of things so it's a difficult thing i think if you want to we can definitely look into the D6 guideline again, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the uses on the property that are going to be impacted and be affected by the D6 guidelines. So it depends what council wants to do. Do you want to have an answer tonight? Or do you want to have something come back to council to take into consideration what we heard tonight? Councilor Bader? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think what happened was we screwed up. And when I say we, um, at the time, I was here, you know, if it got past me, I don't know whether I was there that night, but I'm pretty sure I was, you know. Um, but I would like to put it back to that specific use of a salvage yard that is there. I think that was the use. Uh, non-conforming, can that be done? And then if somebody wants to change the usage, 
in the future, then am I wrong saying they'd have to come back here and ask for that change? And at that time, site plan control would kick in? And, or it, is that too simple or is that, uh, can we yeah. just put it back the way it was? Yep. Through Mr. Yeah. Mayor to Councilor Bonner, yes, that would be a simple solution. And we could also restrict the uses on the property. However, having the zoning change specifically for salvage, council could do that by way of a zoning change. So you could amend the bylaw. And then exactly, Councilor Bonner, if someone wants to propose anything different, it would be something that would come back to council. So just to be clear, though, it was light industrial prior. Correct. So it wasn't zoned. It was not zoned for a wrecking yard. It was zoned light industrial with the usage being a wrecking yard. So prior to you making that decision, the owner could sell it and a guy could come in and store concrete blocks on there or any other light industrial use at the time, whatever was listed in our list of light industrial uses. Well, that's what I asked. Correct, Dan? If it was previously light industrial, it would have followed our light industrial. Uh, whatever was in our light industrial list is only what could have, got, what could have gone there, correct? Mr. Mayor, when the zoning bylaw was put in place in 1982, it was zoned light industrial. When council made the change in 2015, that then removed the light industrial zoning of the property. That, that's what I'm saying. And that's, that's I, I just want to make that clear for the councilor. It wasn't specifically zoned for what he's doing here. It was just came out of the light. light. Councilor Baggett. Answered? You're lost? Is that what you just said or you're last? No. Actually, my question was Councilor Beauregard and Councilor Bogder, so I'm Okay. Good. Okay. Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, okay. My understanding is that right now it is, it's still able to be used for that non-conforming use, correct? Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Demery, that is correct. So it could go forward in that use and where there is nothing we could do about it, that's the way it, it would be. Correct. This okay. plan. Legal non-conforming. So, legal non-conforming use. So we would not have to rezone to be able to allow that to continue on. Sure. Uh, my, my concern is that we make sure we dot every I across every T because there's the last thing I want to see is clinker dust flying all over our neighborhood. I don't, you know, you don't want to see that sort of thing. Uh, we're, we're seeing, I've got reports from, all, uh, from other docks, docks and, and um, industrial situations around docks, and I'm seeing the problems that are hitting communities there. I don't want to see this again. We've been through INCO. We don't need to be through this. So let's be really protective, make sure we're doing exactly the right thing. In the meantime, it can still be used. We're not limiting the use right now. It is what it is, and we can't change that. So it allows it to go forward as a salvage yard. At least there is that. In the meantime, let's look into this and make sure that we do it exactly right. That's all I'm asking. Because the way we're doing it right now, we're disregarding the way that the way that uh, business and, and industry, or sorry, business and, and uh, residential areas live together today. It's very different than it was 40 years ago. Let's not step back. You know, uh, this is a community that does mean something. Okay. Cool. Councilor Clayla. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Dan. Just a quick question, just to be clear. So right now, it is non-conforming. It's, it's zoned as parkland. But if Mr. Dwar were to sell that property right now as parkland, the person who purchased it could continue with the non-conforming piece on it. There would be no problem with that. Mr. Mayor to Councillor Clayla, that is correct. That was that was uh, mentioned to Mr. Dwar, and that was a concern that was raised because potential purchasers wanted to have the zoning in place to identify Late the non-conforming use of the property. Okay. So they want it changed to light industrial so that they don't have to do with the non-conforming that's happening there right now. Correct. Yeah. Okay, just want to be clear. Thank you. Councilor Borkart. To you, Mr. Mayor, I just would, I saw the proponent put his hand up and I would really be interested in hearing what he has, what he has to say about this. So um, I'd be unwilling to move that we waive the bylaw so that he can speak. Waive procedure bylaw so he can speak, yeah. definitely. Seconder. Councilor Bruno, any questions? 
All those in favor? That's carried. Jeff, you can come up to the podium. <sighs> Name and address, please. I'll try not to be too sure. Press the red button, please. There you go. I probably shouldn't speak to you at all because I'm too frustrated. Uh, a scrapyard will be a scrapyard will be a scrapyard. You want piles 20 feet high, you want piles 40 feet high, they'll be there. They'll be there all the time. If you force, I mean, I said to everybody here, if you want it as parkland, buy it. It's for sale. We went to council. After we found out that it had been changed over. Jeff, press your button and just leave it. Yeah, just press it and leave it. There you go. You don't have to hold it. There you go. Ooh. We came here and we, I asked <sighs> what you wanted because it was, that used to be heavy industrial land. I was asked by the region to change it over to light industrial. Adjacent to that property was Wallace. That was part of Dwarves' property. Dwarves severed it. They are light industrial now as Miller. I'm now Parkland. I can't sell Parkland. You can use it, but that's basically expropriation without compensation. That's exactly what it is. It's your wisdom, fellas. It's your wisdom. I, I had the property up for sale, and we came to the city, and we asked them, what is it? And they said, it is now light industrial. That was 2016, just so you know. I have it in my notes. That's when that started. The property's been for sale for three years, well, two years, and then last year when it came in, we found out it was <coughs> zoned parkland. Just, I mean, this is where we're going. So I don't want anything extra than what was there before. I just want it back to what it was. I realize your concerns, but then you gotta buy it. Because the land at 60 meters is virtually useless. That's what you're doing. You're taking a piece of land that could be utilized by someone, anyone for light industrial use. I don't think you're going to see heavy industrial use there. Honestly don't. But that's what you're talking about. You're not talking about putting up what Miller has. That's okay with Miller, but it's not okay for Dwar. Dwar's been there for 70 years. So Dwar will, Dwar will be upset. As you can see, I am upset. And um, that's the, the road we're going down. And I'm going to fight. And if it goes to that, it'll be a fight. And the question will be, why? Why? Don't you need industrial land in Port Coburn? If you want to make it parkland, you can do it. But you have to pay for it. It's my kid's inheritance. So I can appreciate where both of you are coming from. But what are you doing? You have light industrial land all through this town. Is anybody going to come to this town if they know that the land can be taken from them and zoning taken away from them? I don't think so. You asked for taxes on that property. They were paid. Now, it's your call, fellas and ladies, but you're going down the dicey road. So, okay. a Thank scrap you. pile will be a scrap pile, or it will be outside storage like scrap was, if that's what you want to see. But if I'm pushed into that corner, I will have to reopen it. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay, seeing none. 
Thank you. Councilor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'll diverge for one minute. If we um, are in that quandary with the Ministry of Environment, um, the lands that we spoke about a few weeks ago that were changing from parkland all the way down to Allied Marine, when you take away the seaways setback, does that put all of the rest of that land, if it's narrow, the remnant, in question? Struggling. Dan? Through Mr. Mayor to Councilor Bruno, I believe you're talking about the usability of lands that aren't very large in a sense, because the land to the west is the transport candle lands, which the gypsum is being stored on the transport candle lands. No, I'm sorry, just our park land that would be changed. Some of that could mirror, sorry, some of that could mirror the depth of the Dwar property. So if you just ran a plumb down the rest of Welland Street, or we're really in this same situation based on Councillor Wells' comments for those lands that would be light industrial but would need more setback. No, that, this is the only piece of property, Councillor, between Allied Marine and the bridge that was rezoned. South of this, it's all Canada lands. It's all part of the Seaway property. There's not a, this is just a block. It doesn't continue down to Allied Marine. Okay. So this is just the one block you're talking about. Okay. Further south of this is currently light industrial, correct, Dan? Mr. Mayor, the land further south to Jeff Doris property has been changed to conserva uh, park land with a holding conservation zone on it. So if that you're talking about the You're talking about the current St. Lawrence Seaway property? To the south, correct. The St. Lawrence Seaway property? Correct. I thought you were only, uh, in the maps that we have, I thought you were talking about the, the slag pile down at the end. We've talked about that south of Allied. But north of Allied right. is only the door land that was changed. There is, Mr. Mayor, there is land between Mr. Doar's property and Allied Marine. There is a block of land that is federally owned. There is an actual tower there that is for navigational purposes. Correct. Yes, yeah, so, it's, it's under seaway control. Correct. So you're saying you you took seaway land and made it into park land. We did that the same as what we did with the land south of Lake Road. Okay. Well, Seaway will never change from that. They'll just continue to do what they do. I mean, that, they're not going to do that. I mean, they've already indicated any any of this stuff. That's correct, Mr. Mayor. It's federal land. They could do what they like. That's correct. Yeah, we're just trying to make sure that what I'm, we're dealing with here is private land. So, okay, Councillor. Just so we understand that the lands who they're owned by. Yep. Okay, Councillor Baggy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've heard a lot of discussion. For me, the bottom line is if he wants to sell the property, we can't tell him what to put on that property. It's the new owners. If they want to bring in store jello on there, they can store jello. If there's a problem with the neighbors, then we, we deal with that through the city. But uh, you know, I, I don't see what the problem is. Like, we're zoning it right now. Like, I have no problem with it. Because if there's a problem with what's on the property, then we deal with it then. Hey, Council, Council Board, you had your hand up? Yes. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council, I think the prudent thing for us to do would be to follow staff recommendation, but to also address Council Demery's points where we have to put in some um, more stringent guidelines or, or, or exceptions. Uh, that you brought up so that we don't have gypsum or, or whatever being put there. Plus the site plan control will exist. So between those exceptions and a site plan control, I think we can address these issues. If anyone has any comments on that, if I'm wrong, I would like to know. But I think we can do that today and get this passed so that Mr. Dora doesn't have to deal with this anymore. And we can do that and it should be beneficial for the community. I would like to hear others' comments. So, Dan, um, taking what Councillor Borgard said with regards to storage, I think that's what Councillor Demery was talking about, is there a wording you want to put in with regards to a sandy, dirt-type product that 
that she's worried about blowing around, which happens. So, you know, if they're storing steel there or wood or concrete blocks, I mean, other than what it looks like, um, it, it, normally not blowing around. So is there, is there a term in your planning that we can use to not allow some type of dirt piles to be put on there? Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. I would, I would recommend storage of a light, loose material basis not permitted on the property. So I've got Councillor Beauregard putting that down as amendment uh, with regards to that type of substance. If Dan feels that his pl in planning that'll pick up that substance, no matter what it is, um, can I get a seconder to that? Yeah. You, said, you want to read that back, uh, yeah. Madam Clerk? Uh, that amendment being made uh, to include that storage of a loose material basis not be permitted on the property. Well, I, the councillor asked the question, so that's why we okay. we asked Dan for his advice. So I need a seconder <laughs> for that, Councillor Baggy. This is on the amendment about material that's loose material. So um, we have a motion on the floor. Any discussion on it? Motion on the floor. I'm going to take the motion first, councillor. Okay. All right. We have a motion on the floor. This is the motion we're dealing with. Okay. This is just to add to This would be added to the main motion if it passes. Okay. Councillor Wells. Again, I'm not an expert at this, and it's only through my own research that I've done this, but according to Planning Act RSO 1990 CP 13, uh, if I push this to Dan, is that a decision by council or of a municipality shall be consistent with the PPS. A decision by council or a municipality shall conform to the provincial plans and are, that are in effect on that date or shall not conflict with them. If we vote this, we are going against the provincial plan. Okay, thank you. I, I, stand, to be, I stand to be corrected. I mean, I just, I'll pass it out to Dan. That's Any comment, Dan? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Wells and all of Council, Mr. Wells is absolutely correct. Council needs to make a decision that is consistent with the PPS. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions on the amendment? Councillor Bruno. I think this is going tonight just a little bit too fast based on what we know. I'm concerned about that we're not looking at what it, what definitions are. And in, in whilst I think airborne uh, generally suffices, I, I'm, I'm not clear, um, you know, you could store styrofoam there, but if it was banded, it wouldn't blow away. But if it wasn't, it would. Um, I think the issues of, uh, of these other uh, I, I think we need to have the planner go back and and retool this, check the things that that uh, Councillor Wells has brought up, whether they're um, policies, recommendations. There, there's a lot of that I think to be uh, looked at. I'm mostly concerned about the owner of the property, and if um, Dan, how long would you need to put together to to research what Councillor Wells has put in, to start looking at definitions of what non-porous uh, um, uh, materials that would blow away. I'd just like to see something in writing on that, but I, I don't know if Mr. Dwork can comment on, uh, depending on your on your time frame to, to come back to us, is, is a couple of weeks good enough? Is a couple of weeks 
Good enough for you. Podium, if you want to speak. Hold it. Just before you speak, press the red button, please. Thank you. I am frustrated with this. Trust me. I'm very frustrated with it. So if you do want the land as part of it, it's fine with me. you got to buy it. Everything through me, Jeff, please. Through me? Yeah, thank you. Bill, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not trying to be too over-assertive, but I'm not kidding you. If you do want it for parkland, then fine. Take it for parkland. Pay for it. It's yours. If you want to do something else with it, you can. It's it's your it's your call if you wish to have it. But if you take away all rights on the properties to have any other kind of sale, and you prejudice this property over any other property in town, I'm going to ask why. And I am definitely going to ask a lot of questions. So, two weeks, Dan. Can you come up with something that would be logical? Dan? Mr. Mayor, in order for me to get this at the next council agenda, I would have to have the report done by this Friday. That's pretty tight. It's doable, but it'll be pretty tight. Okay. Okay, question to the speaker or no? Okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Okay. Councillor Demeray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Considering that Councillor Wells and I are the ones with the with all the concerns, and we've we've laid them all out, um, I would I would really think that the fastest way to deal with this is for both Harry and I to come in and sit with Dan and work through all of the issues, come to something that we know is likely to to fit what everybody would expect, and come back to council with that. Because this back and forth thing, I'm getting frustrated as well. I need to protect the community. That's my my big concern, as well as have Mr. Dwar be able to carry on his business. Those things have to happen together. But I'm not going to sacrifice that community under any circumstance, and I don't care what threat is leveled. That's how it is. So if we can, uh, if we can do that, uh, Mr. Wells is, is certainly uh, willing, and so am I. We could come in and speak with Dan and, and work work through all the various issues. So we get to a place where we're in compliance. We know we're, we're doing the right thing, and we can bring that back to. Okay. Council. So I have an amendment, amendment that we're a motion on the floor for an amendment. So I'm, I'm going to deal with that first. Okay. All right. You want to read the amendment again, please, so everybody understands? Turn your mic on. Uh, the storage of a loose material basis not be permitted on the property. Okay, so that's, I've got it seconded, moved and seconded. And I call this question. All those in favor? All those opposed? So that's defeated. So we're back to the uh, main motion. A referral? <laughs> a referral? You refer it back to staff, <laughs> okay. correct. Yeah, we'll refer this back to staff, and Councillor Wells and I will come in and work with Dan and come to something that works. Okay. So, with a two-week timeline? Um, I, I don't know that that's really po I think that's a little unrealistic, but maybe. Uh, you know, if it has to be, then I'm sure there are things that we can cancel. But um, that or possibly the four-week. Well, if we, can, if we can, can nail that down, only because... So when everybody walks out of here, everybody okay. knows what's going on. For me, the two-week timeline is a little tight, but um, okay. if I have to, I'll work it. It's just, uh, how are you doing with that? Here, okay. Well, you know, it is fine to rush things, but when we rush things, we make mistakes. If we have time to work through each issue, we'll do it right and do it once, and it's over. I, that's my thing. Yeah, this, plus, you've got a holiday Monday. I, I'm, you're, you're not going to get this done in two weeks. I'm going to tell you that right now. Or staff won't. So you're looking at the second meeting of July as opposed to the first. Correct, CIO? Yes. So it's a referral to go to the... Yes. So we have a referral to the second meeting in July. I think I'm seeing that. Okay. Um, now, so we need clear direction to Dan of what you want to see here. Um, for my part, what I would like to see is that we be entirely protected of the community and that we meet all the guidelines that we're in compliance. Okay, Dan, is that clear enough to start? 
there anything else you need? You're, all, you're, you're okay with that? Okay. Harry, you were going to second that? Yes, I'll second it. Okay. So there's no debate on this for the referral. So we have the second week of July, and you heard what Councillor Demeray, Demeray wants to go back to Dan's department with, with regards to bringing it back to the second meeting of July. There's no debate on this. Except for time. You can debate the time. That's the only thing you can debate. Oh, so well, there's no discussion on a referral or a deferral. So, um, does everybody understand this? Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? That's carried. Okay. Okay, item three, Councillor uh, Baggett. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Fire and Emergency Services Department Report 2019 71, subject emergency management program. Can I have a seconder for this? Councillor Kalalov? Do you want the Chief to give a question or do you want the Chief to talk about this? I just have a question, certainly, Your Honor. Um, because this is a new report, I've never seen it before. Is this uh, the same that comes to council every year, or is it? Is there changes from last year's, or that was my only question, Chief? Your Worship, uh, through yourself to council, the emergency management program is part of the provincial requirement that's uh, to be done on an annual basis, identifying key individuals, uh, as this report does with regards to uh, our emergency control group in the city, with regards to part of our emergency planning process. Um, there's a process that we're in the process of a transition. Up until this past year, uh, 2018, the fire department have always been the ones that have been in the key positions, if I could say that, CEMC, and the assistant uh, C and the alternate to the CEMC, they're the ones that have always uh, uh, identified with regard to the training requirements, the writing of reports, the updating of the emergency plan. Uh, the control group over the last couple of years have made a determination that the fire department should uh, uh, divest itself of that particular responsibility because it seems that our, ourselves and or the works department are always involved in almost every emergency in the city and it's become very cumbersome for us to be able to continue with that so the process is that the program is being rewritten now so that uh, uh, the uh, parks and recreation department um, nicole within that group as well as the clerk for the city will take on the role of the cemc and Nicole would become the alternate. This plan speaks to that. Uh, the bylaw will be brought forward later this year that uh, uh, puts them in those positions, and that will be submitted with our 2019 submissions to the province of Ontario for verification and their sign-off. So it's done on an annual basis. Through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. It's uh, enlightening. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Wells. That's true, you, your mayor, to uh, chief, um, the fire chief. Um, I, I noticed that the I went onto the the city's website to try to find a reference to the program or the plan because I think it'd be very, in, you know, informative for the residents or somebody that wants to look at the plan and see how they can um, activate the plan and program. Um, and the the only thing I got to is by searching through through it through a search. Ser through the search engine, and the plan that came up with date was dated 2009. Uh, I, I just think that it should be easy if we could have an easy access to that uh, link through the website, would be great. Thank you, Chief. Comment on that? You, yeah, yes, Your Worship. Uh, I'm not sure where you were in the city's website. It's not for me to say. Uh, I can say that the plan was just recently updated by uh, by my assistant, administrative assistant. So somewhere in the city's web page there should be a new up-to-date plan in there for sure. Um, I will check on that again tomorrow and confirm that, but definitely it was just recently updated. 
uh, okay. through you, Mayor, to, to the Chief, so he can. Uh, what I had to do is I just searched through the normal search uh, mechanism on the website. I typed in the uh, uh, the, uh, the the name of uh, the the program and the plan, and then I just let the engine search, and then it, what it spit back out at me was the 2009 report. Again, that may be misleading or information on there that need to be cleaned out. Your Worship, Chief? perhaps uh, if you punched in program, you may have got a previous report that had been written, but if you punch in the city's emergency response plan, you'll find it, I think you'll find it up to date. But I, I'll confirm that tomorrow morning. Okay, just confirm that with all the council, please. Okay. We're chomping at the bit for the new website too, mm -hmm. <laughs> Harry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very frustrating. Any other questions on this? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Item 10, Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Planning and Development Department, Planning Division, Report 2019-101, subject creation of a, an affordable housing strategy for Port Colborne. Seconder to this, Councillor Wells, Councillor Demery. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, to Dan, Dan, thank you so much. This was far more than I had expected. So it was, uh, there's a lot of information in here and, and I really did not expect this. I expected a very high level look and this is uh, far more than I expected. And I was really pleased to see all of what you've put in here. Um, just uh, there is some uh, reliance on Bill 108 by the looks of it in here, but th and that will obviously have to get adjusted. But everything else is, is uh, it looks wonderful. Um, I just can't wait to see the actual report be done and, and the plan created. But uh, uh, obviously, you guys are on the right track, and that, that this is this is exactly what I would would have wanted and more. So I think that the city will be well served by this. Um, a lot of work obviously went into it, and uh, from uh, Jeff St. Clair from the region, who's um, the homeless homeless uh, homelessness action plan advisor, um, he thought this looked good as well. So just so you know, it's very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Twelve, thirteen, fifteen. 15. Councillor Demeray. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Community and Economic Development Department, Parks and Recreation Division, Report Number 2019-94, Subject, Fourth Annual Summer Concerts in King George Park. I have a seconder for this. Councillor Kalalef. Councillor Demeray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just, I simply lifted this uh, just to make a suggestion that possibly going forward, this be referred to the granting committee. Uh, it might be the right place to, to look at uh, the funds coming from there for, the, for this sort of thing. That's okay. the only reason I lifted it. Okay. Um, so we'll make sure that Nancy gets a hold of this so that she can contact the proponent. Absolutely. All right. That's fine. Uh, CAO. And clerk, you understand that yes. we'll get it to Nancy? Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Item 16, Councillor Demery. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay. Ritesh Malik of 2493 207 Ontario, Inc. Re request for relief of property taxes and interest for the duration of the development process for 599 Main Street West, Port Colburn. Thank you, Councillor. Seconder to get it on the floor. Councillor Beauregard, Councillor Demeray. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've had a couple of calls about this uh, as soon as the, or, or obviously, as, just as soon as the package hit the website. People started calling, and uh, no one is impressed, neither am I. I, I don't know why we would, we would even consider doing this. So I just I wanted to make the statement that I, I would be opposed to doing this. That's it. So we're looking for council direction. I understand what you're saying. The proponent actually uh, sent a letter to the city through the CAO. That's why it's here. Um, but we need council direction. So if you could give us that. I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yep. Okay. So... Um, I would move that we uh, that we not consider doing this. That uh, we not support this this okay. request. Um, who? You seconded it earlier, right? No, who seconded it earlier? Seconded Councilor, Demer you seconded it earlier. Right? Yes, yes. So you're you're okay with that with, with that yes, motion to be uh, uh, coming forward? Okay. Questions to that? So that our answer basically is no. No questions. All those in favor of that direction? 
that's carried. <laughs> so, no kidding. All right. Any notices of motion this evening? Move to adjourn. Councilor Bruno, Councilor Demeray, all those in favor? That's carried. I'll call the uh, council portion of this meeting to order. Uh, introduction of addendum items. Madam Clerk, any? Um, there are no addendum items this evening. Okay, confirmation of agenda. Actually, we're going to withdraw. We should withdraw that now, correct? Yeah, for, no, for planning. We're not going to go through that. Or just do it when we do the... We can do it in closed? Or just as we go into closed, I'll leave that off? Okay, thank you. Uh, confirmation of agenda, moving to seconder. Councillor Burgard, Councillor Claliff, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Any disclosures of interest? Adoption of minutes, we have one set. Regular meeting of Council 16-19 held on June 10th, 2019. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Wells, Councillor Claliff, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Any items requiring separate discussion? Mover of all the items, Councillors Bodner, Councillors Kalaliff, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. No proclamations. I'll do the minutes of boards, commissions, and committees in block. Minutes of the Port Coburn Public Library Board meeting, May 14, 2019. Minutes of the Social Determinants of Health Advisory Committee, Everyone Matters meeting of February 7, 2019 and April the 4th, 2019. Mover and a seconder for those. Councillor Wells, Councillor Demeray, questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Consideration of bylaws, Madam Clerk. Um, there would be two changes to the bylaws tonight. So 6696-60-19 and 6697-61-19 uh, will be taken off and the bylaws will be renumbered accordingly. Uh, so this is 6694-58-19, uh, being a bylaw establishing an emergency management program for the protection of public safety, health, and environment, critical infrastructure and property, and to promote economic stability and disaster resilience, community repealing bylaw number 6555-10-18, uh, uh, bylaw 6695-59-19, being a bylaw to adopt municipal law enforcement officers, a uh, property standards officer, and a building inspector. Uh, bylaw 6698-60-19, being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw uh, 6575-30-18, respecting lands legally described as Block A on Plan 69-NP828 in the City of Port Colburn, uh, Regional Municipality of Niagara, municipally known as 45-53 uh, Westside Road. Uh, bylaw 6699-61-18. Nineteen being a bylaw to authorize uh, 6695 uh, 5919 uh, being uh, entering into a physician recruitment incentive contractual agreement with uh, Dr. Joe Frantlick in uh, partnership with the town of Fort Erie. And lastly, bylaw 6700 62 19 being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of Port Colburn at its regular meeting of June 24, 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Bodner, Councillor Beauregard, any questions? All those in favor? That's carried. Uh, council now goes into closed session. Uh, I'll call on a motion to go into closed session. The Council do now proceed into closed session in order to address the following matters. Item A, minutes of the closed session portion of the following council meeting, June 13th, 2019. Item B will be deferred to the July 8th meeting. Uh, so we're not doing that tonight. Item C, Planning and Development Department Planning Division Report 2019-103 concerning the potential disposition of city-owned land pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001, subsections 2392C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. Uh, D, Chief Administrative Officer Report 2019-104 regarding Nyan Energy Lands and the Nyan Tank Farm property pursuant to Municipal Act 2001, subsection 2392E, litigation or potential litigation including matters before administrative tribunals, affecting the municipality or local board and 2392F, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, 
Item E, presentation by the Chief Administrative Officer regarding the CAO performance appraisal self-assessment pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001 subsections 2392B, personal matters, personnel matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees and subsection 2392D, labor relations or employee negotiations. I need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Demery, Councillor uh, uh, Bruno. I got so many hands up here. It's just been de the Demeray night. That's what it's been. Um, any questions? All those in favor? All, all those in favor? You didn't say who the seconder was for the clerk. Demeray, yeah, then Bruno. Okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah, it was Demeray moved it. Bruno seconded it. All those in favor? That's carried. We'll move into committee room three. Oh, do you need my help? I know. That's our sound? Okay.